determination without the the responsibility right. of also uh, having to pay for everything. So, uh, you know, it's again, it's one of those cake and eat it too situations. So, and um, obviously, I like I like cake, but um, and I think that's what I think that's what they would love, but. You know, no, there's never been any serious discussion because I think that most of the residents there recognize they just don't have the tax base uh, resources to be able to actually, you know, provide all the services that they would have to provide if they were incorporated city. So I, I would say no, at, not at this time, although I, I would not, I wouldn't be surprised in the future if there's, you know, some significant growth in Dallas Port that they would look to incorporate. Right. Yeah, I did read somewhere in the statute when I was just running through it, so to speak, um, where they can con if there's a, a section that allows them to contract with the county if the county is um, willing and and capable for services that they normally would have to provide. Okay, so yeah, are there any other questions on the information from last time? from last workshop that I brought you. Is your question, Dan? Nope, you're good? Really, we're good. Okay, so we brought with us today, I did the AP and payroll calendars. We'll start out with that. Um, so <clears throat> we have our, our bills for the county are due 10 days before we pay them. You'll see that here from, well, says on the top that you'll see the warrant issue dates. Uh, the special districts, just as an FYI, their lead time on having the requirement for them to turn it in is not 10 days, it's less. So, and those are run on Thursdays. So, um, January um, and this next January will be the same. There are no bills at first first meeting um, because we have to wait for the 10th payroll to post before we can actually pay anything from the prior year. And usually the current year doesn't get paid till uh, the third week in January. We have two or three open period runs in January for bills. And uh, we have to be very careful when we enter them. We have to work with uh, Pam and they're what you call pointers. They have to be changed from one way to another way, depending on what year you're paying the bills. So it's really pretty, um, we have to be really careful because we could really mess up the GL. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's one of the things. Last year, I know there was a concern, Dave, where you didn't have any bills that first week of the year and this next year will be the same. And it's merely on the um, payroll posting. So um, what questions do you have about AP? We can go into it a little more in depth. Nothing. Well, I, I would have a million questions if I was trying to learn your job. Oh, but, uh, well, I'm trying to educate you on what we do so that you either will have questions or you'll understand, you'll have the answers. I have what the basic questions. understanding, yes. Okay, so Heather, did I miss something on the AP? Nope. Okay. So, you know, if we tell you it's a due date, it's a due date for a reason. Yeah. Yep. So. You don't just do those just to be mean. Well, well, sometimes, but generally, no. I guess that would make the question: Is it a due date by statute, or just a due date for you to? It's our policy. Be able to do your job correctly. Yes, in time. that's right. it. It's a right process. There. It's a process due date. Right. Now we have made exceptions for like, oh, uh, sometimes public works like Gordy has approached me because he had something that because someone was on vacation, um, the a pay estimate didn't get processed and he we the county owed your contractor a nail how whatever the name is kirby, uh, yeah kirby nagel i can remember kirby better <laughs> <laughs> um and he called and said is there any way and so we squeaked it in and got it in and i believe there was a separate ap sheet for the board to sign for that one because we'd already run the bills to come down to you 
So mm -hmm. once in a while for something like that, if we can, we make an exception because it's for everybody's benefit. Okay. So, and, you know, payroll, uh, we have the due dates on there. As soon as 15 hits, we're, we're looking at uh, get your timesheets in. Still having some issues with getting some signed timesheets. We had that COVID period where we let people skip. Some people are just typing their initials in thinking that's good enough. <laughs> that's, is, I know there's been talk about online timesheets from your perspective. Um, since you're pretty much the person that would be handling that, is that beneficial for you if we did it online? Yeah, and uh, it's electronic time and attendance. Technology school, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and so the person would enter their time. It would go to the, their immediate supervisor. They would have to approve it. And then from there, if there was another supervisor, department head, or an elected, it would have to go there. Any changes made would go kick back, say a supervisor looks at it and there's something that's not correct. They would make the change. It kicks back to the employee to okay it, which is required. And then it goes back through the process again. And then it comes to us. So that's a very quick <laughs> down and dirty uh, explanation of how that works. It would also alleviate some of the work Oh, absolutely. It would. What I'm saying, I'm looking the way you just described that, my head just started blowing up. With yeah, no, it productivity problems. No, 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 no. no, it will cut. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it will cut tons of work mm -hmm. from so that things that need to be done, you know, we don't have to pay if we need to overtime or comp time. Uh, there's other things that would be nice to have done that we don't have staff hours for that would free them up to do that. Um, yeah, it would be beneficial. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Well, we've gotten it scanned. So she's talking about the the, the uh, remittance slips that you get for direct deposit, which yours is hopefully fixed. Oh. <laughs> um, I got that email this morning. Casey and Pam worked on that. Um, I did cash my last check. It only took me a week, but. That's good. Those little systems have an app on your phone where you can uh, change your withholdings. You okay. can see what your vacation and sick leave balances are at least up to a point. And, you know, and, um, you don't have to call payroll all the time every time. You right. That information is typically you have it accessible. You could also reduce the workforce. People look at their pay stuff. I'm sorry, what? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, HR also reduces their work because they can access it. Um, you know, it's just, it's got a lot of pluses to it. Um, right now, of course, you know, our system is wonderful. We love it. Um, oh, so. Hey, the no peanut reason. gallery. No reason not great. You're fine. Okay. No. Um, For the record, you have that on the <laughs> Yeah, in the most sarcastic tone possible. Um, right now, if somebody wants a copy of their pay stub, we can't just print it out of the system. So once we run that payroll, we scan those and save them in a file. And then if they need one, we can print it for them. But there again, that would go away. They could print their own with that electronic time and attendance. So would you have to still go through the work of scanning them to put them in? No. What, what? Oh, no, like trying to find it's saving more time in it. And the current workload is actually printing two pay stubs because um, the original that prints out does not, it has um, bigger coding timber to the bottom of it. So um, I know when I was there, we were printing a secondary that didn't have a printer yes. and a maker number on there. So, I mean, you're going through an extra range of pay stubs yeah. as well as you do that. That's right. And it and just, well, I would imagine as many employees as we have, when they're buying a vehicle or a house, they didn't keep their last pay stub. So it happens a lot. Then you're it does. Getting yes, it does. The last six and yep. Know. Well, particularly when uh, mortgage rates dropped and everybody <laughs> wanted to refi. Yep. So anyway, I was okay. yes. yeah. so that would 
also save space. We wouldn't have all the paper timesheets. We wouldn't have a lot of. So what do you think in terms of savings? Is it half an FTE in terms of savings and time? Is it I have no way to judge that at this point. I did have somebody reach out to me from the Nova Time who uh, is who I was looking at before. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, let's just wait until we get the new system and get it implemented. But then she reached out and I said, yeah, I says, give us a quote. You know, I figured if nothing else, if it's reasonable, I could come to the board with it after I talked with Rob and, you know. I'd say my biggest concern would be setting up a program and then getting the new financial software and having to pay again to co-mingle those two. Well, that's what, that's going to be one of my questions for them because I made it very clear that we're in the early stages of replacing Kayenta. And um, so she's going to get back to me. Rob's back there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I see Rob. Go ahead. My experience with a couple of public employees is that when they all, I've never not had time to say this, is that um, it didn't reduce the workload on the payroll reports where you could reduce the FT, it just made it more efficient so they could focus on things they otherwise can't get to. That's what I would say. A lot of things, they spend a immense amount of time processing the payroll, so there's a lot of other things they should be doing and probably want them to do, mm -hmm. they just never get to. Yeah. So it makes it more efficient use of the time for other things. I say you're you're kind of you're gaining a quarter FTE or half an FTE just because they're available to actually do something else that is needed to be done that you aren't doing. That you're understaffed for because you, when you ask for an FTE, then we say no. So now you have a little more help. Well, and based on um, audit requirements and segregation of duties and things payroll audits AP, AP audits payroll. So it's, there's, there's not really any downtime there's in not. terms of what folks are doing because we have this cross section of, of duties so that we meet statutory requirements and, and policies and procedures for auditing and correctness. And so um, payroll doesn't just do payroll, AP doesn't just do AP. Yes, and we get an accountant. We always we go through. There's the entry. If somebody's entered it, we have an audit, um, and then there's the first audit. Anything that is caught with that gets corrected. Then there's a final audit, which normally the accountant does, but I've been doing. So you know, it's uh, you'd still have those processes in place, but it'd be a lot simpler. So yes, either Brenda or whoever, can you give me some sense of what, what does an electronic time and attendance um, system, what does that cost? I mean, well, that's just what a, I, that's what an I, idea. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, $50,000 or $500,000 or $5,000. I won't know until after this lady gets back to me from Nova Time. Okay. Because last time when I brought it up, and I can't remember if Jerry Pettit, the auditor from Kittitas, came down or not. I know he was going to. I thought he did to present to the board. It was not well received at that point. And I pursued it no further. So. Wouldn't the new fiscal software have that as a module? module? Sorry, go ahead. What? Wouldn't the new fiscal software have that as a module off of this or have it built in, Brendan? It wouldn't be a self standing. It could be. Software. It could be. Yeah. I don't know. So, right. um, and it was, I was all incorporated into the one, uh, you know, financial software. If that, if it can have that capability, makes sense yeah, that, rather than having to integrate. Right. And that's, that's, those are going to be some of the questions I have along with the cost and, you know, how that works and who are their customers? So what softwares are they servicing? You know, so that, email just came in uh, yesterday or the day before something like that yeah so anyway i'm so i'm we're trying to focus on right now before the state auditors come which i have an email out asking what their schedule is going to be um, on making sure we get all the timesheets from the covid period signed um, with what signatures um, we have a lot less now because Nicole's been after them, but we had several departments that had unsigned timesheets. So I'll be following up on that a little more. Um, 
our payroll processing is always two days before payday. So for us, payday is two days, two business days before payday. And um, that's when the ACH is released for all the direct deposits and everything has to be balanced. Some of these turnarounds on this payroll calendar are very, very short. So, um, I don't, I didn't get those marked, which ones they are, but. Well, it, like if you look at January. Yeah, January. Because right. the first was a holiday, timesheets were due on the 4th, and we had to process on the 6th because payday was the 8th. There you go. So yeah. we had two days to, yeah. to receive all of the timesheets, get them entered, get them audited twice, and process payroll. And the second pay period wasn't any piece of cake either. So um, some of them are reasonable days, uh, you know, time periods like this one, we've had a few, ex not extra days, but we're not short, like killing ourselves, trying to get it done. And, you know, then if you have retros or we try to encourage people and Rob's been great with, with trying to help us to encourage departments to hire <laughs> um, at the first of the pay period, you know, like don't hire them in the middle of pay period because that causes a lot of angst for our office in processing the payroll, um, the first one. So it doesn't have to necessarily be at the beginning of the month, just at the beginning of whatever pay period. Well, it's like this, if you're gonna hire them, hire them on the 16, <laughs> you know, or the first, yeah, or the first, first working day there, you know, that, doesn't always work that way if you're really short-handed and you need somebody, whatever, but it uh, used to happen on a regular basis and kind of was kind of, you know, tough. It's particularly an issue if people are changing from one, one uh, county department to another yeah. because you have two different jobs, two different pay rates, yep. two different departments. And all the deductions are different rates. Well, most of them, not all of them, but most of them because they're based on percentage of the gross. So, um, yeah, or they get a promotion in the middle of the middle of the, yeah, same thing, but yeah, hired. So are there questions at all about payroll? Okay. Well, that was simple. Oh, you guys are dull this morning. Man, look at the clock. It's half hour into it, you know? <laughs> uh, so, Get into some budgeting. Um, of course, we covered part of that last time too, given that. But the budgeting, we have the statutes, as you know. Um, there's a statute where the auditor is supposed to uh, call for the budget, and Jen and I have come up with dates, and she's got her, we did, we did do a resolution, right? Or going through, yeah. yeah. I thought we did. And so there's a schedule. Um, <laughs> So our office started processing the and preparing the preliminary budgets that would come to your your office or Jen last year. So this is fairly new for us. Glenn has a way, and I have hopefully documented good enough to where it's not that simple. You go out and you create the reports and in Word, and then you parse them over to Excel, and you or, move them over there and you have to do a lot of different things with them before they get it's ready to upload into Google Sheets. And then you have some editing to do in there <laughs> so that um, everything is correct. And then you can actually send the email with the link and the invite out to the department heads. So, and that's all done online. What? Good. Oh, I'm sorry. Just a, in what you're talking about mm -hmm. going back to Kayanta and not being able to um, export a report very well into Excel. So yeah. that's why she's having to do the very Right. Dave, can you hear her? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. All right. Because I can sure. barely hear you over here. Sorry. I was about <laughs> to tell you to go sit in Mr. Cornell's chair and maybe I can hear you. But... Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was wondering because you're soft spoken. So I didn't know. Okay. Right. Yeah. So you're over there by yourself. <laughs> um, so that's, yes, it's a system issue as to why all that has to be done. And then after you get it into 
the Google Sheet and you proof everything and people put whether they need new bars numbers and all of whatever they need. And Heather assigns new bars numbers and lets them know. And then I have to go in and, or whoever goes in in my office uh, and, and you edit the sheet and you gotta be in, you have to be careful not to mess up the totals. Um, and that all has to happen before you release it to the department heads and electeds for um, entry. So, and once it's all good and you upload it into Kayenta, which if you, my phrase that I was raised with, if you, it sounds easy if you say it fast, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, upload all that easy. You have to do a lot of gyrations as Jen would say with it. So, um, you know. Brenda, can I ask a question on that? Because even, so when you're inputting that, you know, the stuff that comes in, are you, are you physically like, you're not rekeying everything into the, into it, or are you just taking the stuff that was submitted electronically and then, um, you know, uploading it into the Kayenta or is it, is there some actual hand work going on? There's a lot of hand work before the Google Sheets even ready. I gave myself a couple of weeks working with Glenn and I should have given myself at least two more weeks because obviously if you remember Dave, I was late getting them out to the departments. And that's why I didn't realize how much prep work there was to get that Google Sheet prepared for um, the departments to enter into. And then once they enter into that, we go through and make sure that, you know, their numbers add, that they didn't mess with the formulas and, you, you know, it, there's a lot to it. And then after you get that done, then when you upload into Kayanta, there's some manual work that has to happen as well. I mean, is that something that, you know, a newer system, you know, as we look at a financial software with uh, a new thing, that that's something that we can eliminate some of yes. that? Hope yes. I just okay. stop you before you go further. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It is, but it is a script upload. But that's after you get it into Google Sheets. So, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes to all of your questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then once it's ready, you know, I will let Jen know, and then she'll do her thing. So. Right. Yeah, she's looking at me with big eyes. <laughs> okay. So, um, and then we obviously we budget accrual or gap, um, and we report cash. So, I'll get into that shortly. What other questions do we have on budgeting? And that's just a quick, dirty, down and dirty overview. Quick, down and dirty, messy. Yeah, it is. Right. I mean, yes. That, uh, normally, Glenn would do a budget workshop for all the departments. Yes. So we've uh, asked Brenda if she'll work with us and Heather and Brenda and, and um, Jen and I to put together that presentation from the aspect of both departments. Um, prepare because there's always new people that have never done the budget before. HR prepares all of the salaries and that. So there's a lot that goes into it. And, Brenda learned a lot last year of things that if we let them know up front, and we learned as well. That's it correct. Makes, makes the process go. So right. it will be a new. It'll be a new version of Budget 101. Yeah. And we okay. won't. Have, think, go ahead. I think that's a. Yeah. <laughs> it's different. I mean, we were under, um, you know, there were, you know, different people had different uh, points of view as far as how we did it in the past. Uh, but you know, one thing, you know, Glenn was very good at what he did as okay. far as the, the way that things were set up. And, and so this is a brave new world and we are, um, I think, I think it's a, a good idea because we really last year was sort of still, you know, kind of a hybrid of the old way. And I think, you know, this is the first time. Uh, that we're going to be doing this a little bit differently. And I, and I think, especially because we have some new folks too, uh, that there's some, so that they have some understanding of how the process is going to work. 
Right. I think that budget workshop is a good opportunity because we need, Brenda will need, all of us will need the commissioners to lay the foundation for the budget process. What are we telling the department? New staff, no new staff programs, no new programs. What right. guidelines that you want departments to build their budget under? Uh, and I need to know that as well from, from the commissioners at some point, maybe that point, because mm -hmm. we're talking June, July, and then we're into the budget process. So we we'll need that guidance from the commissioners. Right. And we're still back. Well, my, my, right? yeah, I know. Default, <laughs> my default guidance is always no. <laughs> no convince me. <laughs> well, that's simple. Okay, we got that. <laughs> So one other thing about the, the budget um, that I, is the auditor's requirement that I did not do last year, um, and just saying it's a statutory requirement, I remembered it about October. <laughs> um, for the veterans levy, there's a statute that the auditor goes and has a convoluted formula uh, one half of 1% of the total valuation and then I have to go to the assessor and get all of the current valuation, the new new construction, personal property, all of that. And I have a formula on a spreadsheet right now. So otherwise I would tear my hair out. And then I plug it all in there. And then if it's um, if it's a, if it falls under a certain threshold, then the commissioners have to budget. And if it's if it's above that threshold, they don't have to. It really. Um, and that's an RCW, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I say, yes, I've it actually is. seen that. And I right. don't remember why or where, but. Yeah. Um, as long as we're talking about levies, uh, I would highly recommend this uh, revenue guide for Washington counties. It's a publication from MRSC. Uh, the levy, the Washington state levy process is highly convoluted, and this does a really good job of explaining that process as best as it can actually be explained. So that that's my recommended reading. Can you have a PDF form or a link to it on the MRS so you can send to us? I can say it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Send it maybe to Lee and she can send it on out. But, that but I didn't need to make question. a note if you're going to send me a link. Yeah. Anytime you guys have questions, MRS, MRSC is really good because you can search their many uh, publications. It's a wonderful source of information. It is. It I is. A lot. Thank Me you, Heather. I forgot I, you had that. I proofread that multiple times. So I'm very proud of your background. Oh, yeah, because you were on the finance so. committee. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, um, so, what questions might you have? Um, none. But I will ask um, when she sends over that link, is there a way to get a nice little three ring binder of that? Sure, you bet. Okay. So, one thing I wanted to talk about with cash and gap budgeting is um, explain gap okay. budgeting a little bit for me. It's the governmental. Generally, Generally, yeah, accepted. yes, generally accepted accounting principles. My brain just went, be like forgetting what bars is, right? <laughs> anyway, it's um, counties, it's a lot stricter for reporting. Uh, when I decided that we were going to go cash, yes, she'll bring you the book to look at. Sure, thank you. Oh, that I see. You just copy that. Yeah, I thought you had taken your other book. I wasn't. I just saw you go with the book. <laughs> um, counties that report gap have to have. Um, they have to meet a higher standard than cash. Cash is cash. You know, the treasure is cash. Even if we budget gap, it doesn't matter. The treasure is cash. What's deposited on the end of the year is what you got. Where we have the open period, and that that's also allowed for cash reporting, but um the journal vouchering of expenses back into different prior periods and we're even into now budgeting we're we're done though right with but jv's back to 2020 i don't know did you i think so okay because like to get another one in. okay the annual report can't begin until all of the accruals are done 
also um, for us with and if you have more questions on budgeting, bring them forward. I'm just going to morph on into the annual report. Actually, yeah, I did cover that. Okay. Um, we have to, Pam set up a period 13 for us so that um, we journal voucher all of those accruals <laughs> out of the year end and get a cash balance to balance too. And those are all reversing journal vouchers. So then once we're all done, we have to make sure period 14 balances with 12. And that's what has to happen. And if, like, again, if you say it fast, it sounds easy, um, but it's not. It's in, in trying to balance and make sure you get everyone's accruals backed out so you, you can report cash accurately is, um, is a tough thing. So if we were a cash budgeting, if our budget was budgeted on a cash basis, that's how I'll say it. It's probably the proper way to say it. Um, all of those that happen in the open period would obviously go to say 2020, but anything else wouldn't be journal vouchered back. It would be, we'd be done. So. You, you look confused. He is confused. So when you, when you I can tell cash <laughs> is recorded when it's spent or the cash base. I yeah, see. cash is recorded when it's spent or when it's received. Right. Gap is accrual. So you're accruing uh, accounts receivable, accounts payable, and you're recording a liability and an asset that, that hasn't been received yet. Yes. So um, when yes. we spend in the open period, that's technically in a new year, we're putting it back into the old year or receivables that came in in January that are actually for expenditures in the previous year are being accrued back. So that's what we're, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So in order to report cash, we have to reverse all of those because that's not truly cash. So that's we go through good. these machinations to reverse that accounting so that we can report correctly. But then because we're still budgeting accrual, we have to undo that so that we start the year like we ended the year. So we have these two extra periods that that undo the accrual and then redo the accrual. Right. Does that make sense? It does, I guess. I... It's a lot of work. It is. I guess I'd say I have a question. I just don't know how to word it, but you even understand the question. Um, So we'd only, anything in the open period is fine because that's the open period. But anything after that is what gets accrued back. It's, it's particularly um, in grants because if you're billing for the fourth quarter, you're not billing the fourth quarter until the fourth quarter is done, which is obviously December 31st. So you're, you're receiving money generally in the next quarter for the previous quarter. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, I would. I would say. I know the the obvious questions. Why do we do it that way? That you know, it's like we're we're creating all of this issue, and that's mostly it has to do. There's many grants that are, are accrual. You have to do them accrual as far as the as you said. You're 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 not going to get you're not going to get the reimbursement for something until January or February, but it really was a fourth quarter expenditure and it has to get backed back into that quarter. And it, but it is, it's, it's a very convoluted and it is rife with potential to make mistakes because when you're, when you, you know, end up with one set of balances and then you take this back out and then we put them back in and then when all of that's done, that all the numbers have to end up being the same numbers, and that's I know is really difficult to end up uh, to to get that, and that's part of the reason why our you know the preparation of the annual report is such a headache for the auditor and her whole team. <laughs> so, uh, so that's something that's a that's a bigger discussion later about what really needs to be accrual and what doesn't need to be a cool that we're doing 
now, but that's that's a future discussion. Yeah. And I know public works, they maintain that they need to be accrual. Um, and again, probably for their grants and their job costing, all of that that they have. Um, so a lot of counties do have two systems unless they're reporting GAP. We cannot, I don't believe we can switch to GAP because number one, I don't have, I don't have the staff to do it. And even Teresa, I don't think could make it work because the reason I changed to cash reporting, much to Glenn's dismay, he was not happy with me, but that's my call, was because there was a new GASB, which is the rule that came out. Governmental Accounting Standards Board. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. That said. Uh, practice. I never remember <laughs> Yes, Heather's our number. There's a what? What? I said, you're the acronym whisperer where you can yeah. translate acronyms for. Well, you. I think back to my interview when Brenda hired me and she <laughs> asked me, do you know what a gas <laughs> is? Nope. Do you know what gap is? Nope. Do you know what the bar is? In? And I said, well, probably not the answer you want, but um, I have never said no so many times in an interview and still got the job. It was great. Uh, uh, yeah. so, came from private sector. I didn't really expect them to know, but uh, the new Gatsby that came out said that we had to report um, our depreciation schedule on all of our capital assets which included our bridges and roads and all of that. And we don't have that. And if we didn't provide that, it was an automatic finding. <coughs> I said, nope, we're not going down that road. So I switched to cash. And that's where we, how we got into this mess because we budget gap and we report cash. So I'm mentioning that with, uh, I brought up the finance committee that I'm going to be uh, submitting a contract amendment, uh, Teresa TDJ, the CPA that we have doing our annual report, advised me that there's gonna be an additional 50 hours because of some of the things that she had to do. So that'll equate to about, I don't know, $9,500 or something additional from what the original contract was. And how accounts payable is, we set it up, I'll go back to AP, so it's set up and, and a department has a contract for X amount of dollars with a vendor. Well, once they reach that amount, the person that runs AP puts a stop on everything until you get a contract amendment. That way there's no cost overruns unless she slips up. So, um, you never did that one. Hey. <laughs> um, so I will be, when it's ready, I'll get it to the PA and get it over to you. But uh, it's, it's uh, not something I really wanted to do, but it's a necessity. So, okay. So additional questions on cash or gap that we can help with right now? No, that's good enough for now, unless you're furnishing drinks. Maybe I need five. a drink or two to Maybe after the five. bars manual. <laughs> oh. So, um, yeah, and there's different audits. There's a single audit, the accountability audit, and the financial audit. The single audit is the one is, uh, I'm not sure why they call it a single audit, is for all of your federal grants. And when they come into audit, there's a threshold that they you have to you know, meet, um, so they they calculate out on a, through a formula of, of um, I think your expenditures and in, in that, I can't remember what their, the state auditor, um, how they come up with that number. Now, last year, they just had one grant, right? Or was it the year before? Yeah, but they all run together. Okay. Some years well, it's one grant, some years it's depending on. If you don't meet the threshold with one grant, then they'll go out to others. Um, usually public works has had uh, enough in grants that they focus right there. One year, and I don't, Dave, I don't know if you remember if it was two years ago that 
they had something from seniors on public health and all the, do you remember? Yeah, that was two years ago. And the reason why it was, uh, we didn't have a lot of road construction projects that year because that is kind of cyclic. A lot of times we let the, the grants build up and then they'll, they'll have a big year doing stuff. And so the public normally, typically public works by itself is enough, uh, there's enough dollars expended that they can just audit that and that's the road program and that's good enough. But if they don't, like it was then, they had to kind of go look, they had to accumulate enough expenditures to do the audit and it was seniors got audited and public health got audited as well as public works. So that was a, that was a banner year. Everybody loved that year. I oh, think yeah, that was two years. Yeah. Yeah, they set a threshold and I apologize because it's a, how they set their threshold is available and to, I didn't bring that information. Yeah, and I, uh, if I'm remembering correctly too, it actually costs us more too as far as to have oh, the yeah. audit because they're auditing more departments than it, it costs us mm -hmm. more money to have. So, um, yeah, we don't like that. So I'm a, well, actually our, our um, the county services building, those, those aren't grant dollars. And so that won't qualify. And so hopefully public, I, we'll have to see. I mean, obviously there, the stuff is under that. Do we know actually for this year, if public works can have enough that that's gonna be the, the only federal programs that are gonna get audited? No, we have not heard from the state auditor yet. I have an email out asking when they're coming. And then um, they usually, once they set their schedule, they get their teams together and decide which teams are going where and when. Um, they will let us know. And I ask if they're going to be on site, off site, or a little of both, because we'll have to find a spot for them. Um, so that might be something I need the board's help with. Just saying, Dave, you know the history there. Yeah, no, we'll we'll find a place, and it may be 2020 because that's you know they're auditing 2020. It's if as I think about it, um, that might actually happen because public works purposefully last year was a light year because the building was under construction, and they didn't you know they wanted staff to have uh, capacity to kind of help manage the project across the street. And so we may be in that situation uh, this year, which should be really exciting because of all the COVID dollars that um, that sloshed around between you know public health and uh, even seniors, there was some too. And so there will be plenty to audit. I think. Well, um, had a too, but yeah. And that the single audit is triggered if the government expends seven hundred and fifty thousand or more in federal grants. Thank oh. you. And we did so. But and no. we did. Yes, well, I'm we sure. Did. We did. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, we did. The COVID, the CARES money qualified under that single audit as well. So. Okay, I was going to ask that. Would that be even though it passed through? Department of Commerce, it was federal dollars. Federal dollars. Yes, federal yeah. dollars. So, oh, wow. Okay. There'll be lots of auditing going on this year. Well, so. Yeah, and it, I'm not sure how they come up with their threshold. Thanks for looking that up, Heather. That's something I failed to get. Um, yeah, so, and the other thing is we we don't want a finding anyway, but if you get a finding on your federal grant, your Schedule 16, as they call it, the federal single audit, um, that affects your well, the, the whole overall annual report, all three pieces of it. They're your credit report. And it also, the, the single audit jeopardizes uh, your, it, it puts a black mark next to you when you go to apply for federal grants in the future. Also, when we renew the insurance, um, you know, we have it on a three-year cycle, but the uh, individuals we renew it you know that the public official uh, liability bond that gets renewed annually and every year I have to provide a copy of the annual report and if there's a finding there are a lot of extra questions and accountability measures that I have to document um, and uh, there's a potential for the premium to go up so 
that I mean, it it is our credit report, no matter how you look at it. You know, you're going to go out and buy a house or a car, and they look at your personal credit. Well, this is what they look at for the county for bonds or other things. Um, so, you know, we start out, and then we get, you know, the whole annual report. It pretty much runs from <laughs> from year to year, right? Pretty much. It does. Because as soon as our our uh, open period is done we start trying to gather what we need for the annual report and it's due it's 150 days after year end i think it is which usually is like may 30th or may 29th depending if it's a leap year and this year it's may 30th and it doesn't matter if that's a saturday or sunday well, they don't that care. is a hard date it is a hard date yeah and uh last year they give a little bit of time on it or something after we, yes, they did. After we had filed, we, they, yeah. yes, they waited until like May 29th to yeah. say that there was yes. extra time. I remember because yeah. I had to do one and I was scrambling and then I got the email and I was like, <laughs> yeah, right, they did. But um, yeah, we had already filed ours. And so, you know, we've had problems in the past with some departments. Um, getting things to us timely this year has been significantly better we're still a little shy on do we have everything now we didn't um we do but last week we still were waiting weren't we on that one yeah. yes okay yep we have everything yeah. now and so um that's a big challenge because you can't start 10 days left yeah you can't start finalizing everything until you have all of the pieces to see if you balance um so you do it on online on the GAO website the same as Teresa does yeah well she does it on the state website yeah on the SAO yeah website. and normally the accountant would do it but we don't have one right now so that's Teresa and Katrina are the ones that have the authority to do that through the portal I hate that darn website <laughs> so different. and then they change it every year like I print mine out you know like with the questions and answers and all that and then you go in the next year and you're like Got to make sure I answer it the same, and then they change all the damn questions on you. Yeah, yeah. Same. Yeah, they do. That's, I, yeah, I don't know if that's. Um, Thanks for the reminder. I have 10 days to get it done. <laughs> I'm going to do two of them. Sorry. <clears throat> so, anyway, as soon as we get it filed, we still have the audit to go through. And then when they're here, the auditors usually send us ahead of time. Uh, a list of things that they would like or need to review and we scramble and get those together as timely as possible because the longer it takes us the more money it costs us and i think they're up to i don't know two about two hundred dollars an hour i think something like that i can't remember without looking at their their letter and they'll tell us at the entrance conference so there's always an entrance conference usually they've already started the audit when that happens um it can be done two ways it can be done individually with each board member and not a public meeting or it can be done in a public meeting um so that's the public meeting is what's been chosen last few <coughs> years uh and so we just we're on you know high alert mode for whatever they need as soon as you know they start asking we get it get it out to them they work with all the other departments um get what they need the backup the questions have to answer from the grant the departments that have the grants that they're auditing um and they audit our policies and procedures they make sure that we are following all of our policies and procedures so like you know the handbook sometimes people get a little grumpy with payroll issues that we bring up but if we're auditing timesheets to the policy we have to make sure that 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 they that we comply with our policies because then when the audit state auditors come in and we're not you know auditing to our you know they find something we missed we could get written up so there's um there's the management letter that is a recommendation that when they get done, that if you don't fix what's in there, it most likely will escalate to a finding. And unless the management letter is presented in a public meeting, uh, it's not public. You know, um, that is a, a something between the auditor, state auditor and the client. If 
the client chooses to have it in a public meeting or make it be public, that's their choice. So, which would be the board. Does it doesn't fall under con confidentiality, does it? I mean, if somebody public record requested it, they can still have access to it, right? I believe so, but I can't really answer that. I think that if it's not been made public, it's not available. <laughs> So, you know, like if you, if they have a management letter at the exit conference and they have given it to you um, outside of, you know, the exit conference and it's not put in the packet or it's not, you know, that's, it's a choice right there. That's something I need to investigate more with the PA. About, yeah. yeah, and I don't, I, you know, that's the thing is a management letter is for management's use where the finding is a public, definitely public. So, um, but I mean, so, some of it is because the management letter divulges weaknesses in our systems, which you don't necessarily want to put out to the general public. So I, I yeah. believe that that's why it's not presented in public meeting and why I don't think it's... Well, it was last year, I think. I think it came out last year. But normally it hasn't. Normally, we, yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got some things to make sure departments have fixed. <laughs> and, Which, and that's that's regular. I mean, you, you see those like... Yeah. It seems to me like every time they come in, especially on the smaller junior, uh -huh. like they will find, they will do whatever it takes to find something. Yes. So that it gives them value to yes. say, fix this. Right. Or we recommend it's something for your money. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Other than a good old boy out of boy. Yeah, I know. So, um, you know, until. Leave them something to find and then they're good. Yeah. <laughs> My it's secret. gonna leave my secrets, Dave. <laughs> so <laughs> one thing that we always look at are the higher wage earners and the uh, decision makers, uh, their timesheets, their expense, um, you know, reimbursements, anything like that. They always look at that. Uh, that's one thing that they come in and look at. So um, yeah, there's. So, so define high wage earners. So generally they pull about a dozen yeah. um, payroll people. Um, Public Works is generally on that list, both for its administration and its union guys. Uh -huh. um, Sheriff always has at least a couple picked. It's not generally elected officials, although occasionally they go looking at the judges. Um, so our our top income earners or people who've had a huge change um, in in what they earned the year previous. And sometimes that's about the fact that you didn't start till November, so you only had two years worth of payroll. Two in, months. Two months. Yeah, sorry, two months worth of payroll in the previous year, and now you have a full year's worth of payroll. But there's a huge discrepancy in the previous year's earnings. They also generally pull the payroll individual just to make sure that payroll's not cutting itself any extra checks. Yes. Mm. Same with accounts okay. payable, they'll look at that, you know, like, looking for fraud. Like there's a high potential that mine will be pulled this year because of right. the, the jumps in the moves. Yep. And then uh, in the past, you know, I know our earners would Glenn, Glenn was one that usually got hit. Randy Post was one that usually got hit. Gordy, Jeff, Dave McClure. Anybody who has like an additional contract um, agreement with no. their hire, as well with Rob will Davis, likely get hit this year. Um, you know, would would be flagged and have to pull probably later. Yeah. And and now I know who to watch out for. And and yeah. so for us. Do they, when they come down and, and they do their the annual, do they just charge by the hour for every hour? Is that how it works? And know, their travel time and their expenses. They don't come down for like the, the juniors. They do, you know, they call right. They do it all online or whatever. Yeah. And they do it based on your income. You know, it's supposed yeah. to be by the hour, but they, they, they say, you know, if you make $100,000, you know, it's this price. If you're small and you're only $5,000, it's this price. Nope, it's an hourly charge. They assume the county can afford it. Yeah. 
So and what what does it run? Did we run the numbers last year? Like oh, <laughs> was eighty. You did that. Uh, Seventy five to eighty thousand. Eighty five, maybe at the high end. But, they give us an. Yeah, usually you can figure a five percent increase every year. So, and my personal opinion is that it took longer last year to do everything remotely than it did when they were on site. Oh my goodness. It was more work on our end, okay. certainly, and it was like, probably absolutely. more work on their end. And we had to get what they needed. We had to scan it as PDF. We had to send it to them. And any questions they had, we had to address. Yes, it was a huge extra amount of work for us last year. That's why I asked when I sent the email, hey, when do you plan on coming? And A, are you going to be here on site or a little of both? Or is it all going to be remote? So we'll find out. So what's the time frame? Are they usually here for two weeks? <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. When they come on site, you know, usually they're here two to three weeks and then they continue the audit. We're still being charged and they do a lot of prep work before they show up. Um, no, the audit pretty much they show up um, probably the second week of July, usually, but it's been different. And they know to avoid fair week. Um, even though it was COVID last year, they tried to avoid fair week. <coughs> And then they have to be done and have everything so we can file the single audit by September 30. Because if that audit is that single federal audit is not filed by September 30th, it's an automatic finding. And again, then you have issues getting federal grants. So yeah. And usually it's down to the to the wire getting that thing done. This year they were I think a week ahead of time last year. Like yeah, they were, it was, I was like amazed. <laughs> we had a few extra days. So, um, yeah, it's the audit and preparing for the audit and gathering documents for the audit because they go through all the minutes and they look at all the resolutions, all the ordinances, all the actions that the board took. Um, I'm sure Lee gets plenty of questions from them when they're here. Uh, and then they come to us and they say, well, are you doing this? Has this been done? Show me this, you know? So, yep. So usually the accountant will go through and pull any of those things that would be helpful when for preparing the audit and to answer the auditor's questions when they show up. I don't know that that's going to happen in 2021. <laughs> Takes that position. So what she's telling you is when you see me sitting rocking in the corner, crying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, other questions on the budget? No? Have we ever had a finding? Yes. <laughs> yeah. How long ago was it? 2016, well, it was 2017 for 2016. It was uh, for cash receiving. And prior to that, we had one when I first came into office. Um, let's see, this is a long story, so I'll make it short. So basically, I had some employees, an employee that was preparing the report, and they brought it to me in a beautiful book and whatever. And I went through and I ticked and tied the numbers got down to the last two funds and I didn't do it. Well, she was using someone else's spreadsheet that she didn't have the key to and we were 1.1 million off between ER and R and road. <laughs> Bingo, we got a finding. Huh? It was 2000, 2007 for the 2006 audit. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, yep, that's not going to happen again. So, and, and she'd been told multiple times by her supervisor and by myself, don't use so-and-so spreadsheet. You don't have the key to it. Don't, you're not, you created your own, right? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, well. So with that finding though on the single, I mean, that wasn't on the federal. It was on the, on the county audit. It was not on the grants, no. It didn't affect the single audit, it affected the, well, I have to think back about that. And then the cash receiving, was that a policy or is that a... So that finding was on our accountability audit because there's three pieces. This, yep. The single audit, which is the federal grants, 
the financial, which is our books, and then the accountability audit, which is our procedures and policies and how well we're um, taking All care of public money and, and you know, reducing chances of fraud and theft and that kind of thing. And so the cash receiving was on our accountability audit. And we did not have adequate policies in place for cash receiving as far as the state auditor's office was concerned. There was no finding of fraud or theft. Right. They just didn't say, right. they didn't think we had policies in place to safeguard public resources. So we worked on getting those policies and procedures written up. Shelby worked with all of the various departments that the uh, state auditor tagged in getting those those compensating controls and policies in place. She had training workshops. She helped craft policies for individual departments. We still have a couple that, that that's on our management letter that we need to follow up on. They absolutely do not like it when you share a cash drawer. And in my office, that's not possible with licensing. You can track who did the transaction and that, but um, they they want everybody to have their own cash bag. Right. And DOL will not do that when you have multiple users and two, two workstations. And so, yeah. So what they want to see in place in, in those kinds of things is that they're big on compensating control. Yeah, com is, compensating. Yeah. If you can't, because you know, in a smaller county where you only have, you know, two people in an office or you, there's only so much you can do. So they want your procedures to say, here's how we compensate for the fact that we can't have separate cash bags or, or that there's only two people in the office. So that's, that's so, what those were about. But, but we hadn't changed anything prior to 2016, right? We've been doing it the same way and then they've been auditing us every year. And We've been warned. They've given us warnings for yeah. that. And there are hot button issues that they pick every year, at, at depending on things, yeah. you like know, last, fairs were yeah. big last year, year. Last year clerks was were big one year because oh, yeah. several clerks had gotten in trouble for not appropriately dealing with fines and penalties and things. My so. office was hot one year because of the changing of the recording fees and, and the legislation. They passed like three pieces of legislation to increase recording fees, which they're going to go up again, I think July 1st, right? That's right. To 200 and some bucks for the first page. And they obviously can't audit everything. Right. So they've got a they, you know, spot check it. thing. But they get together and decide statewide what their focus is going to be. And that's what they hit. And on the um, on the SIFA on the single audit, they are that sort of rolls down from the, the feds too as to what their target issues are looking for. They receive guidance on what they should be looking for in those audits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it's it's complicated. Nothing easy about it, that's for sure. Come spend a day with us. It's lots of fun. I've been to through two audits myself, so. They're fun. You think about it at our level. Yeah, no, it was, it was fun enough at my level. <laughs> so, um, the state auditor's website and MRSC are, have a wealth of information. Are there more questions on the annual report right now? Did I miss anything you can think of? Okay. So this is some information, all the color sheets that I provided you. This is uh, from the state auditor's FIT tool. And they look at your annual report. And this is for 2019. And um, this is all of our governmental funds overall. That gives you the graph showing um, what's good and what's cautionary. And so, um, Change in, cash, change in cash position is cautionary, it looks like, overall. And if you go to the next page, this is our general fund, the current expense fund. Again, that's your, see the decline there, that's why they have that change in cash position as being um, cautionary. I'm not sure what caused that exactly. Um, so, and these are based on 2019 right. to get a report because yeah. money hasn't been filed yet. Right. Could that be based on our, our use of reserves for the building? It could right? be. It could be. Um, I don't know how much was spent in 19 on that, I write off, but 
Uh, and this is something anybody can do. So that's year in change, right? Huh? That's that's just change in cash position of year in ending cash. Right. Position. Yes. Okay, so Dallasport wastewater. Um, yeah, that's concerning. They're under concerning. So. And well, ironically, the cash balance efficiency Yeah. Yeah, looking at So this is, like I said, this is based on our 2019 annual report. And the next one I just threw in there for information because that fund has now rolled up into uh, general fund. So, but that just shows why it had to, because when when you're um, a 400 fund, you have to be able to bill out and uh, at least, you know, break even. So. Efficiency. Yeah. yeah, this is insufficiency here. We yes. need it. We need sufficiency in a 400 fund. <laughs> so it's yeah. So um, pretty much that's. I mean, I have lots of other things. I tried to cover everything and not go too far into the weeds. Um, I'd be glad to go further in the weeds if you would like. But you got ten minutes to your board of health meeting, right? You huh? guys are doing a great job. And thank you for all of the, the training and the reminders to go do the stuff. Yeah. Just some fun facts before we leave. Oh, yes. I hold them down here. Yes. This is the bar's manual. This is the Bible of, of how we function with our accounting. Do I system. ever have to know that? You don't. <laughs> but um, please know that if you have a question about um, an object code or a bar's number to come to us. Yes. Um, to no, ask or to you. get a new number assigned because there, there is logic to the way that the numbers are, are organized. And this is slightly updated, it should be a little bit fatter, but this is all of the bars numbers the county currently has. So, so we started creating wow. that. So when you know when we decide we don't want new bars numbers or ways to get around setting up new bars numbers or new funds. It's not because we just don't want to do the work. It's just there's not all of these are being used. There's a lot of noise in the system as part of it. So we'd rather not create more noise. Yeah. Anyway, there's lots of lots of numbers Can out you there. Change a bars number. I mean, if a bars number is used for whatever vehicle expenses. And you don't use that for five, 10 years. Can you use that bars number for something else? Or is that bars number dead for life because it was used for this thing? Here? So it generally it's assigned, it's given a name and it, I mean, it has its number sequence and it's given a name that assigns it to something. What we've done is we, because the, the Cayenta system has different year data sets, which is part of why we have this pointer issue and why we can't do AP and because we create a new data set going into the, the next year. So we can basically deactivate old bars numbers so that they don't roll forward. That's part of the process. I can use that I number again. For Once it's again. deactivated, you could reset it up as something yeah. else, but your historical information then will be skewed. Yeah, you, don't, yes. you don't really want don't to do want that. To. And no. so one of the things that happens is uh, the state auditor's office, like, you know, say Microsoft changes stuff just because they can. So elections went from being 51170 to now it's 51440 rather than changing all of our 51170 bars numbers what we do is we change its mapping in the system so that now when it's reported the system triggers it as a 51440 those don't necessarily mean anything to you but um, so there are ways as bars numbers change to change it without changing the bars number because people are accustomed to numbers and we don't want to just wholesale redo everything that everybody's been used to. But as we go forward, we'll use the new numbering system so that things are correct on the rolling next, forward. Yeah, we have a cross but, that we have to roll everything up into for the uh, annual report too. And the state changed the bars number. Yep. Right. There's no apparent reason other than to make life more difficult. Well, them. I think that that generally accepted the um, oh, GSA, is that right? Changed, they had something that they changed that caused the state auditors to change it. I'm not entirely sure um, what, but 
I think what happened probably with elections is everything else in the auditor's office is, is 514. So our admin is 514.10. And it may be that it's just because elections falls under the auditor's office that they've tried to lump it into that. Because they were 511.70 and 511.80. But anyway. Yeah. So you'll see that when the budgets come out that some of them have a different you know, number schema. And that's why when we switch to a new financial system before those numbers get imported, all of those numbers are going to be changed so that when it rolls over, all the history and everything goes with it under the new numbers. There's there's also, this is the, the uh, cash manual. There's an equally fat binder of the, the gap manual and the bars numbers are not necessarily the same. So um, I know that this was a question that Jim Sizemore asked when we were setting up bars number for public works because they're functioning under an accrual system. Um, sometimes they ask for bars numbers that uh, our office doesn't want to give them because they don't fit our structure. Right. And yeah. so to take a gap number means I have to crosswalk it to something different so that it fits. And, and so there have from time to time been disputes between the auditor's office and public works about bars numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing, you guys at the, before uh, May, you used, at the end of the year, you used to send out an email uh, and it had like every expense and everything so I could upload that to the SAO website and then, you know. You're I talking have, special district. Yeah. Um, and I haven't got that the last couple of years. Um, so, at the end of 2020, I was doing my job, senior accountant and AP. So that's why you didn't get it um, in the timely fashion that Kathy would have gotten it to you. I believe that Christina did send all of those out. If you don't have it for the year end, email Christina and she can. Or what, what department, what uh, districts, irrigation, oh, irrigation. White district. salmon, yeah. irrigation. Okay. Are there? To, she may have sent it to somebody else too, right. based on whatever Kathy's contact. List right. Was. And that's the only one you need. No. Uh, let's see the water conservancy board. We do it ourselves. So yes. So yeah, that's the only one. Okay. So Christina, but it's always nice the beginning it's of really easy to upload that, and then like mm -hmm. fills one of those boxes in the thing. Mm -hmm. and then, mm -hmm. and Christina didn't it. start till the beginning of February, and we were still so there were, I there were other. <laughs> yeah, but e email Christina. Okay. Yeah, or I'll t I might tell her when we go up there just to send it to you. That would be. You want it to your at the top of my email. So do you to put what on it? Your, it? It's it's like everything that we did for the entire like right. every single thing. I get with that, but did you say put something in the the uh, about oh. the you know like the rebox? You know, put you want your county email. No. Okay. No, send it to the, the irrigation district. Okay. And then she can just put 2020 year end report in it. Yeah. On the, okay. Okay. And that way you won't have to ask. Okay. Any, do you guys have anything? Do you have something? No. Okay. Thanks, Dave. All right. Thank you. No, we're, we're good. Greg? You have anything, Greg? He said no. Okay. No. He no, he said my head. I wasn't on mute. Sorry, I was on mute. Greg hasn't moved for like 10 minutes. I was wondering if he was sleeping there, but he's not. <laughs> I actually just took a picture and posted it. <laughs> no, actually, if you watch, you can see his in his glasses that his screen is he's working. So he's oh, multitasking. he's multitasking, oh. not paying attention. No wonder he stayed home. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, well, thank you guys. Yeah. All right. No, All right. Thank you. So we got about four, three or four minutes for board of health. So you need to run down the hall. This is your chance. Okay. So All right. I'm going to do repeat that. He was talking. Full compliment. Uh, so I will call the meeting to order of the Clickitat County Board of Health. Uh, let the record show that all uh, five commissioners or board members uh, are present. And so I would uh, I would entertain a motion to adopt the agenda, uh, or if there's any additions to it, this would be the opportunity to make that. Okay, I have a motion 
um, from Commissioner Anderson, a second from Commissioner Christopher uh, to adopt the agenda. Any discussion on that? Hearing or seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, uh, any opposed? No. A motion passes unanimously. That brings us to the meeting minutes from the last meeting, the April meeting. Um, any any comments on those? Chairman, not, I, I would a motion to approve the minutes of April fifteenth, twenty twenty one. Okay. Uh, Second. Okay, I'm going to give that one to Sue. So uh, I have a motion from Commissioner Anderson. Uh, second from uh, Member Pennington to uh, accept the April fifteenth meeting minutes. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Uh, so we have our minutes adopted. And that brings us to our first um, order of business. And I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to you, Miss Quinn. Uh, okay. For I think uh, Dr. Person, if she's online, was actually gonna do hers first, and I oh, can't I see if yeah she's available. She she on yet? Okay, Dr. Person, yeah. are you? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you again for the uh, opportunity to uh, provide the monthly update. Um, as usual, I'll sort of be talking uh, a little bit high, higher level trends and Aaron will cover the many good works that are going on in the, in the county as a whole. So when it comes to COVID-19, I think we are really beginning to uh, turn the corner uh, in terms of seeing positive movement forward, uh, not just in terms of the governor's uh, announcement allowing for the plan to have full reopening by uh, June 30th, uh, but with the availability of vaccination uh, to really provide that safe and effective uh, long lasting uh, protection against COVID-19, uh, we really have finally have options for uh, being able to uh, address this pandemic. Uh, so. We are continuing uh, to see uh, people getting vaccinated, although uh, as Aaron will speak to, our, our rates uh, are slowing uh, somewhat with being able now to vaccinate down to uh, age 12. Uh, we likely will see some improvement in, in those rates uh, as families in general uh, tend to be more supportive of vaccination with recognition of the value of other childhood vaccinations. Um, and particularly with the freedoms that getting vaccinated allows uh, in terms of not needing to be quarantined if exposed after you've been fully vaccinated. One, the one area we're gonna need to continue to watch is across Washington state, we have are seeing that variants are becoming the predominant circulating strain. Uh, there have not been any variants identified in Klickitat County yet, uh, but we do not have that many uh, specimens that are um, that meet the criteria for sequencing. So I would say it is really more uh, we haven't yet identified the variants that are circulating and not that we don't see variants circulating uh, because all of the surrounding counties for Klickitat uh, do have variants identified. Uh, good news uh, on that front is that uh, the predominant circulating variant strain, the B117, uh, the available vaccines uh, have been demonstrated to be uh, effective against that strain. So 
even with the variants, vaccination still remains an excellent option uh, for providing safe and effective uh, protection against COVID-19. Okay. What the other, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Sorry, there was, oh, I, I, yeah, I, I, I yeah. forgot the question. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I momentarily lost my train of thought there. Uh, oh. The one other um, issue that I did want to talk um, a little bit about just as we um, are moving uh, into what uh, our uh, disaster behavioral health experts kind of talk about as the, the reconstruction phase. So really, you know, moving to the uh, point that we're moving out of the um, pandemic, you know, disease rates are going down, people are um, able to get out and, and do more. Uh, what we'll want to watch for is that this is the, the phase where sometimes we will see an increase in um, risk-taking behaviors, particularly uh, in our uh, adolescents and, and young adult population, um, just because that they generally are the population that um, has uh, higher rates of those risk-taking behaviors. And with the warmer weather um, coming up, that also tends to uh, sometimes trigger more of those um, outbursts, aggressive behavior, um, violent behavior. So, you know, that's always my reminder uh, to all of us that we want to remember to, you know, continue to be kind to one another, uh, whether we're uh, wearing a mask, not wearing a mask, whether we think someone's vaccinated or, or, or not vaccinated, and just to try to remember that individuals, you know, make choices that they feel uh, are best for themselves or their families, and they may have a number of reasons for doing one or the other. Um, our goal in public health is really to uh, ensure that the community as a whole uh, continues to be uh, protected against COVID-19. And it isn't our goal to stop every single infection, uh, but to ensure that we're minimizing any morbidity or mortality from COVID-19 uh, and reducing any sustained transmission. Uh, so as we continue to see our numbers of people getting vaccinated going up, that's where we're going to see that even if we still see cases of COVID-19, it won't be that everybody who gets COVID-19 is, you know, infecting one, five, 10, 20 others. Um, we'll be able to stop that chain of transmission. Uh, and that's what I anticipate we'll continue to see moving forward. And now that's it for me. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Person. Any, uh, any questions uh, for the good doctor? Not seeing any, since this is virtual To Raise your hand, get, get our attention if you need to. Okay, uh, I'm not seeing any. So we will move on then to um, Ms. Quinn. Good morning, I'm in White Salmon today. We've got vaccine clinics going on. And so we're continuing to do a lot of vaccine work, which we're pretty excited about. Uh, Countywide, we've given over 18,000 vaccines total as a, as a group. So that's KDH, North Shore Skyline, um, and the health department in both Goldville and White Salmon. We're at about 31%, just a little over, I think 31.8% uh, of our population total has been vaccinated, which I'm actually really proud of, but which is still lagging behind the state, uh, which is at 47%. So we definitely still have some work to do, but I... Um, I think we've been very successful so far, especially in, in our county. So I, I think we've done really good work. Um, we are, uh, I have engaged with a group called Health Commons. They're a nonprofit and they're gonna actually help us do some data uh, analysis that's gonna help us focus our vaccine efforts. So they'll look at um, if there's access issues, if there's a certain zip code maybe that is, has less vaccines, if there's access issues, um, if we need to do education with a specific group as far as zip code, age, gender, race, um, and just kind of see where we're lacking and where we can maybe do some education to encourage people to make the choice to get their vaccine. So we'll continue to work on that. We're hoping to kind of have some initial data in the next couple of weeks for that. 
Um, the vaccine programs from the state, we have lots of vaccine. We have more than enough vaccine as of next week. Whatever the group's order for vaccine, we'll be able to just receive. Um, up until now, we've had to kind of do some, this week I get so many doses, this next week you can have more doses and kind of divide them up based on kind of who's got vaccine clinics. That's all gonna be done next week. So any provider in the county can order as much or as little vaccine as they want, uh, which just takes a little bit of um, access, you know, that just decreases potential access issues. So everybody's got more than enough vaccine. Um, KVH, North Shore, and Skyline are really starting to focus on the, the 12 to 18 year olds. Um, and I'll let them talk. I think Rob is not here today and I'll ask Cindy and Leslie to just do a quick update. Um, Skyline's working on putting together a clinic for, um, for the 12 to 18 year group in here in a couple uh, of weeks, I think. And then I know I'll let Cindy talk about hers and if Leslie, if they have plans to here in a minute. Um, so we're really kind of focusing on that group right now. Um, otherwise, actually, I'll just have them do their vaccine updates right now. Leslie, do you, are you, I think I see you. Are you online? I'm going to give a. Morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, so we have a vaccine clinic this afternoon at the fairgrounds. We have 240 people scheduled. Um, we have another about 300 people scheduled in clinics. Um, first and second doses over the course of the month. So again, thanks for letting us use the fairgrounds. That seems to be the um, location of choice. Uh, with the, with the um, small outbreak at the high school, we've gotten a lot of calls in the last few days to schedule um, students. So um, we've added some more, some more days for those clinics and we're just still, you know, in the vaccine business, we've administered almost 6,000 doses will continue to do so. We've got plenty of Pfizer vaccine. We're redistributing to North. Um, you know, we can do, you know, farming as well. And that's, you know, approved for 12 and older. Um, that's kind of where we're, we're at right now with, with a vaccine. Okay. Thanks, Leslie. Are we... Um, um, how about I think Cindy, Cindy is on the phone as well, and she can do the update from North Shore, and then uh, we'll go from there. If I think I saw Cindy up there. Yes. If you're available. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead. So, uh, first to just we really appreciate the partnership with KBH and being able to get all the Pfizer vaccine. Um, we've done about. 5,000 doses so far, and we'd never have been able to do that many without them um, helping us with the vaccine. We're doing, as Aaron said, the 16 and 17 year olds. We've got 12 to 15 year olds on the schedule for the next couple weeks. We've got a couple hundred of those kids scheduled already. Um, and I think all of us are current at this point. Um, so, you know, there are no waiting lists. And as soon as people call us, we get them in as quickly as we can. We've done some outreach clinics at um, like St. Joseph's and we're gonna be back there again for second doses in a week or so. And, um, you know, look forward to the data that Erin will have to help us know where to focus. Um, but just trying to meet people wherever they are. This next week, we're gonna be um, offering, we're gonna pilot offering the vaccine in clinic. So, you know, when people are here for an appointment anyway, to see if we can get that opportunity and to be pitching also to the folks that are coming to test that have a negative test to try and get them engaged in, in vaccination as soon as we can. Um, but overall, it, it does, you know, we are still continuing to do two to 300 a week. Um, so it, vaccines are the gift that keep on giving. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Cindy. Thanks. Cindy. Go ahead. Um, so just from our own vaccine clinics, um, this, those folks have really been, Rob's unable to do the update for Skyline today, but they've, you know, they're working on some stuff as well. So um, for our own vaccine clinics, uh, with everyone else focusing on um, kind of the teen age group, we've been really focusing on offsite vaccine clinics. Uh, we've been working pretty heavily with the agricultural community in our county. Um, I think we've been at 13 different orchards and given over a thousand vaccines in, in those groups. And um, 
one of the things we identified this week is that the vaccines that we've given on the east side of the county are actually probably being uh, tallied under Benton, Benton Franklin counties um, because at the east end of the county, even though it is a quick attack county, their zip code is um, associated with Prosser. So we're going to look at getting our, um, I think that will help our numbers at the end of the day so that we can better reflect what we've actually given in this county. Um, we are definitely seeing, and I think Cindy and Leslie would agree as well, that there is a decreased interest overall in vaccines. Uh, we're having a harder time um, getting our clinics filled. Uh, Cook Tech County is still doing, we're doing um, clinics on Thursdays in White Salmon. We're now moving to Thursday mornings as we have kind of the less um, less interest. And then um, I think they're moving next, starting in two weeks, they'll move to Tuesdays in Goldendale. So. We have open online scheduling, which we haven't really promoted yet. We're going to start promoting that probably next week. We're just working out like one more little tiny bug. Um, so you can just go straight to our website and you can register for your vaccine online. Um, you do all of your paperwork that way so that when you get to the clinic, there's no, you've already done your consent, you've already done your paperwork. So that's really helping us um, go paperless, which obviously is an environmental concern. Um, and then uh, it, you're, you're hanging out with us less time, which for some people is. Um, less impactful in their day and, and they've, it's been going really well. People have been really receptive and really excited to be able to use that. So um, that's been going really well. Uh, I worked with KVH this week um, so that they could use it. I wasn't able to be there in person. Um, there's a couple of bugs we have to work out for them. And then I'm gonna work with Skyline. They also have an opportunity to use that as well. Our vaccine clinics, we've had some just amazing volunteers. I'd like to thank Paul and Sue, who have both volunteered as providers to be at our clinics and help give vaccines and help drop shots. And they, you know, it's been really nice for us to have them interact with our staff. So we're very grateful for them and all of the other volunteers that we have had at our vaccine clinics. It's made a huge, a huge difference in our capacity. And on days when we're busy with cases, having those volunteers has just been invaluable to us. So um, that's kind of where we're at with vaccines. Uh, do you, does anybody have questions specific to the vaccine clinics? I have one quick question. This is Commissioner Christopher. Do you have the number, uh, total number of vaccines that have been destroyed in the county or not used? I do not have that number, no. we. Um, we have wasted very few vaccines, I think, at any provider, but we're at the point where we have to start making decisions about if there is going to be, if the, the benefit to opening a vial of vaccine to vaccinate those who are maybe underserved or have access issues may outweigh the risk of, um, of wasting a vaccine. And I think all of the providers in this county are at that point, it's going to be a clinician uh, decision based on the individual's circumstances. Um, so unfortunately, I feel like we may continue to, we may see some waste in the coming months. I think everybody has been more than a steward of being mindful about the vaccine and being very careful about it. Um, there's very, there's just, we haven't um, had any waste. There's extra doses in each vial. So we could get 10, um, it's a 10 dose vial and we've gotten 11 and 12 doses. So if we have one dose at the end of the day, we don't consider that waste because that is technically an extra, um, an extra dose. Okay. That was not counted for. So it's been, it's been very low or any waste that I'm aware of and, uh, but it will likely go up, which, um, I, I mean, that's what we're going to have to do with decreased demand. We can't always find 10, 11 or 12 people to make sure that they're vaccinated with that vial. Right, I just know in some counties, the number is um, astonishingly high. So to hear that you're saying it's very low is is a good, a good, good thing. No, all of our providers have just been incredible stewards and been very responsible about, um, on days when we've had extra vaccines, we've gone over in White Salmon, we've gone to the post office and just asked everybody if they wanted it. We've gone to the grocery store. They've made announcements for us. We've Facebooked and this is not anything that any of the other entities aren't doing the same thing. Um, in our clinics, we everybody gets their phone out and texts all their friends that they know that aren't vaccinated and we've all run out of those folks. So um, we, we make every effort to make sure there is no waste. And I would feel confident saying that's the same case for any other healthcare agency in this county. 
Commissioner Christopher, I'm curious where you when your your statement about it's astonishingly high in other counties. Where is that data coming from? I I haven't seen any of that. I would be really interested in seeing um, that data. Um, you would have to contact the health departments in those counties to get that data. Okay, and that that's what you did. I did, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other vaccine questions? No? Okay. Um, just kind of where we're at as far as case counts right now, uh, we are currently, we have 845 cases. We've actually, we're about half the cases we were last month. We had 63 total cases in April, which is um, one of our larger or um, higher case count months um, in the 14, 15 months we've been doing this. Um, so it's definitely come down. That's been good. Um, we did unfortunately have uh, one more individual that had passed since our last Board of Health meeting. So that brings us to a total of 10. Um, and currently there are 20 cases that are active in the county. Um, our, we're seeing our average age drop. It's been pretty consistently in the mid 40s over the course of time. I think it's finally dropped into the 30s within the last week, just as an average. So we're definitely starting to see it in, in younger crowd, which is consistent with what they're seeing kind of also around the state. Unfortunately, we had our first school outbreak uh, this year. So that's more than two students that are positive in a school. Um, this is outside of a household. Um, so uh, we've made it through the entire school year. We've had schools in since August in any different number of forms. Um, so we've actually done really well. The unfortunate part is that up until recently, students were able to sit at six, they have been sitting at six feet distancing. Now they're sitting at three foot distancing. That did not change the definition of close contact. The close contact is still six feet. Um, so that actually ended up kind of doubling the number of close contacts we had with this group that then it would have been a couple of months ago. So um, I think I touched base with Ellen this morning um, at the Goldendale School District. She's the superintendent there. They had about 50 students out today that were close contacts um, and about 20 at the middle school. So um, the, the school, I think, is handling it very well. There's been a lot of challenges this week. Um, there's been a little bit of a change of information. So we've worked, I think we've all worked really well through that um, with everybody on the same page and we're able to coordinate with the hospitals and the providers and the school district and the health department. So we was sharing the same information and on the same page about uh, what their quarantine and close contacts look like. So um, that, that's been pretty productive. Golden Hill School District, and I, I can't remember if I've mentioned this on a, a call before, they were a part of a pilot program. They were one of 13 schools in the state of Washington that was chosen to implement an on-site testing. Um, so they uh, were set up to do testing. They were able to test 45 of their students yesterday um, that potentially, depending on the results of that test, could get them back to school as early as Monday, depending on what the test result is, and as long as those test results come back in a in, in, um, normal amount of time, which is the 24 to 48 hours is what they anticipated. So um, we've obviously learned a lot of things since this is our first school outbreak. Um, definitely bumps in the road, really happy with where it's turned out, and I think uh, obviously, hopefully everyone can get vaccinated over the summer and we never have to do this again. Uh, but if there is another school that does have an outbreak, um, I, th I think we'll, we're well prepared at this point and we know just kind of the best practices. So um, they, they've, they've done really well. I know it's been frustrating for parents. We know uh, it's been frustrating for everyone, but I think we're in a good place. So hopefully we'll continue to continue to get those kids back in school as fast as possible. So um, the only other thing I just want to touch base on really quickly was uh, mask guidance. I know that's still confusing for a lot of people. We're getting a lot of questions from businesses. Um, we don't have any guidance yet. We're still waiting for the Department of Labor and Industries. There are the ones that are going to, um, that ultimately as a business, everyone's going to be responsible to as far as masking policies and how to how to have the discussion about who's vaccinated, who's not vaccinated, when you should be wearing a mask and, and when you should not be wearing a mask. So uh, we're waiting for that guidance too. So uh, just be patient with us as soon as we get that. We're definitely gonna make sure that that gets out to everyone. 
<clears throat> Thanks, Aaron. Um, any questions uh, for Aaron from board members or comments for that matter? Not. This is Jake Anderson. Aaron, I, I, I like the numbers that the average age is dropping from the mid 40s into the low 30s. Do you know what percentage of our population over the age of 65 has initiated the vaccine? I did not, that's part, so that's part, of, I can tell you statewide, I can pull that up pretty quickly, but that's part of why we're engaging with this uh, data analysis company, because I can't, um, I don't have a reasonable way to put that data together. Okay, and then, um, so then do we have a list um, internally of every person in the county who's gotten it? So if you need to do direct marketing. So I there, do not know. There's and that would not, be appropriate probably for me to pull that. So that so in essence, there is really no way to tell who has and hasn't got a vaccine statewide or nationwide. There's no. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it will be at people's word or if they choose to share their vaccine card. This is Sue. Um, thank you, Aaron and Dr. Persons, if you're still on um, very much for all the hard work. Uh, it is really comforting to know that you are at the helm. So thank you. Thanks, Sue. I would echo all those those sentiments as well. I've seen them. I've been I've been through when you're doing the shock clinic down at the health department. Uh, in White Salmon, and I, I would echo, uh, Aaron, your earlier remarks about volunteers. You've had, you've had lots of great volunteers that are uh, helping some of our Board of Health members, as you said, so that's, that's good. That's putting your money where your mouth is, or putting your time uh, where your priorities are. So I want to thank those members that are doing that as well. So other, other questions or comments for Aaron? Okay, not seeing any. Oh, I, uh, go ahead. Hi, this is Dr. Person. I, I just wanted to, to add uh, one thing just from one of the questions that um, Aaron got. The CDC's COVID-19 uh, data tracker does um, capture some information about vaccinations by age range. It's not quite as up-to-date as the Step that comes from the Department of Health, but from their site uh, in, in ClickAttach, 66.5% of people age 65 and older have been fully vaccinated. Okay, that's good to, good to have that information. Okay, thank you. So about two thirds. Okay, well that brings us, we're, we're moving along in our agenda here. Are there any, um, I guess, issues, comments that any board members want to bring up? Uh, this would be the opportunity and then, because um, if not, then I would open this up to the public as well. I would just uh, add that I, I too greatly appreciate uh, the work that the health department is been going and been ongoing for the past year. Um, and Aaron, you're marvelous. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you too, uh, Dr. Person. Yeah. Okay, well then I will, uh, this is, I guess, we're to our point in the agenda that this would be uh, public access. Uh, so if there's any members of the public that wish to address the Board of Health, uh, I would I would ask just from experience that your your comments or questions be something that's relevant to the Board of Health. Um, uh, that's that's kind of an inside joke. Sorry. Um, so this is opportunity for folks uh, if you want to address the Board of Health. So please raise your hand or get our attention and uh, give us your name and your community uh, that you're that you're calling in from. I'm not seeing anybody. I don't see anybody in chambers, so. Okay, 
out. We are running way ahead of schedule. So is there any other business to come before the Board of Health today? I can talk really quick about something that's not COVID. Okay, go ahead. Um, so every year we get what's called foundational public health services money, and that is just to kind of bolster the work that we do in public health. So typically it's been pretty thinly spread as typically, you know, in a normal non-pandemic year, public health is underfunded. Um, and so everybody's scrambling for each of those pennies. So given the fact that the clinic is very well funded this year, we've given all the money to the environmental health um, team to use to kind of improve their programs and processes. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about, um, and David's actually working pretty hard at getting done is for in anticipation of fire season this year, which we hope is not a thing, but understand that it's pretty, there's, you know, there's not been a lot of rain. Um, that we were able to purchase six air quality monitors um, and that we're in, um, David's working on installing those around the county. Um, and so I think, um, There'll be what there's one that's already been installed in Trout Lake. Uh, one will go to Goldenville, one will go to White Salmon. Uh, Bickleton is going to take one of them. Um, in at some point, hopefully soon, we'll actually have one in the um, in both health departments. So in Goldendale and White Salmon. So they'll they'll be in the county building for those of us in the new county building. And you'll all know how our earth quality is. Um, and uh, Dallasport is where is another one we're gonna try to get placed. So um, when we were all looking at the air quality apps on our phones last year, the air IQ, um, now it will have those six locations in the county that will help kind of us understand where our air quality is um, throughout the summer. So uh, anyway, that's just a non-COVID thing that we're pretty excited about. We're also, we just got a very small grant, but we'll be doing mosquito trapping um, and looking for West Nile virus over the next couple of months. Um, so it's just a couple of things that we're doing that are actually nothing to do with COVID. Um, oh, and we also upgraded our water labs. So we're gonna have a little bit increased capacity to do water sampling. Um, so they were able to get new incubators and refrigerators and viewing tables. So um, that will make their, um, their process a lot more efficient and, and um, definitely increase the capacity for the work that they can do around water testing in the county. So. A little non-COVID update. Okay. Yeah, there are other health issues besides COVID. I know we've been um, pretty solely focused for the last 15 months, but uh, lots of other stuff. That The Board of Health is not the Board of COVID. It's the Board of Health. Yes. Uh, good. Thank you for reminding me of that, Eric. I, I had hoped that we would start transitioning in the next couple of months to actually doing a little bit more of the Board of Health work and less COVID work. Um, so that, that's yes. kind of my own goal. So we'll hopefully talk more about other things that are not COVID. Okay, good. Anything else, uh, the good of the order? Uh, one thing, just a piece of logistics. This is more actually for staff. I did, um, uh, Lee had sent me a chat about something and the chat function is disabled. Uh, I can't respond, but um, I'm a yes for the 11 o'clock, just so, so since Lee can hear me. <laughs> and I did get your thumbs up. Okay, I didn't know if you figured out that's what I was saying, but. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Ah, technology. Okay, anything else, members of the Board of Health? Okay, not seeing any, then I would, uh, I would certainly entertain a motion to uh, adjourn. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I have a motion from Commissioner Anderson and seconded by uh, Commissioner Christopher to adjourn the Board of Health. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you all. And the weekend. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I already started with the good afternoon. <laughs> Except there's good morning. Good morning. Um, so I have with me my chief appraiser, uh, Billy Bear. She has, um, she's been with us for six years. I hired her as an appraiser um, trainee, and then she became 
a full-fledged appraiser. And then she accepted the chief appraiser uh, position when our um, chief appraiser retired uh, last year. And um, so uh, she's here with me for a moral support, as well as <laughs> as well as um, to interject any you know details or whatever, and and as a learning experience to uh, present you know to the board um, for workshops or whatever. So I was hoping that I could do just a short presentation on how our office is required to value property, whether it's real or personal. Um, this would really help me to just kind of address uh, information that has been discussed in public venues and, and to kind of dispute the misinformation that just continues to get recycled over and over out there. Uh, no matter how much I state certain things, they, they're just not um, being heard. So uh, the first thing is there is no such thing as an industrial rate. Rate is either a millage rate or levy rate. Um, it is not an assessment rate. So there's a lot of discussion out there of why, why am I not going to assess uh, property at an industrial rate? Well, there isn't such a thing, therefore I'm not going to do it. So um, real property. Our office is required to follow Washington State RCWs and WACs when, a, when assessing property. WAC 458-07030 states that all property must be valued and assessed at 100% of its true and fair value unless otherwise provided by law. So there's no limitations on an increase or a decrease of your assessed value in any given year. Um, WAC 458-07030 030 section two goes on to state in determining true and fair value, or we call it kind of highest and best use, um, the assessor may use one of three approaches, a sales approach, or we call it the market approach, cost approach, or an income approach, or a combination of the three. Um, typically we use the sales approach for the majority of property within our county. Um, we do, however, have a few properties that are assessed at um, a cost approach and a few at an income approach. The cost and income approaches, according to statute and the Department of Revenue's recommended methodology, shall be dominant factors considered in determining true and fair value in cases of property of a complex nature or for property not having a record of sale within five years and not having a significant number of sales of comparable property in the general area or close enough where we feel there wouldn't be too many modifications to the location and, and whatnot. So in determining which approach to utilize to value parcel, we ask ourselves, is the approach systematic, logical, consistent, and is the data we need for that approach readily available? WAC 458-07030 section four states that in valuing a lot or tract or parcel of real property, we must determine the true and fair value of the land, excluding any structures or growing crops. We then must also determine the true and fair value of any structures on the land or growing crops. The total value of the two combined cannot exceed the total value of that property. Um, taking what I just explained into account, parcels that have a change in use, say from a farming lease to, or from farming, whether leased or not, to a lease for say solar farms, it may change the approach to value for that land itself. Um, we value the property at its highest and best use, regardless of what title appears on the property in our records. It's the highest and best use. That's how we value property. So that's, the basic overview of real property and structures. 
So personal property is generally valued using the cost approach. The acquisition cost includes freight, trade-in allowance, installation, and any fees incurred to get the machinery operational. Um, its original cost new less depreciation is the basis for valuation because it's easily attainable. The method lends itself readily to a computerized math, mass appraisal format and the trend and depreciation tables are easily updated. The Department of Revenue publishes a personal and industrial property valuation guidelines book, booklet that they update each year. This booklet has an index to show what trend or column each class of property is to be depreciated at. The guidelines are based on the typical physical depreciation and functional obsolescence for assets that have been maintained in average condition. And the percent good table estimates a percentage of the remaining value of that asset. The valuation table depreciates property to a minimum of 15% for most types of property. This takes into consideration salvage or residual value as long as the equipment is still in use. Regardless of age or condition, it's considered to have value if it's still in use. There have been questions on why uh, wind turbines and now discussions on solar panels are personal property. WAC 458-12005 section two defines personal property as machinery or equipment of any commercial or industrial business which operates on leased land or rented quarters. Such machinery or equipment is a trade fixture, i.e. it's the tenant's personal property no matter how firmly it may be attached to a landlord's realty. So an item of clarification that I would like to point out is we have one permitted solar farm within our county. The original owners still own the land. The taxes for the county records are the responsibility of the land owner for the land taxes. Um, they are not the responsibility of the lessee in the county system. Um, during public discussions and conversations with people in my office, often the assessment and taxes of the land and the assessment and taxes of the leasehold improvements have been kind of combined in, you know, why aren't you doing this? Why don't you do that? The solar facility should pay more. The wind facility should pay more. They're separate entities. It's the same as if you leased a building for a restaurant, the building is assessed to the landowner. You receive rent for that, the building is assessed to the landowner, the landowner pays the taxes. The lessee has the ovens, stoves, refrigerators, tables, all of that leasehold items within that that they pay personal property taxes on. It is their responsibility to do that. Um, so just one other little quick thing I wanted to touch on is new construction. There's a lot of discussion on um, when a project comes into the county, how is it going to benefit the taxing district and how much taxes it's going to generate. So new construction requires our physical inspection to be completed by July 31st of each year. We have 12 months to inspect a building permit. We capture what percent complete the structures are at the time of inspection and that value is then used for taxes in the following year. So if you have either a huge project or you have a new house or garage that you're building, when we go out there and look at it, if it's what we consider in our books as like say 50% complete. We're going to assess it at that. You're gonna get a notice about that. Next year's taxes, you're gonna pay taxes on that 50%. The remainder, hopefully if you're completed, will be done the following year or then the year after that. Um, taxes. As far as districts and new construction, we have 44 taxing districts within our county. So that's entities, fire, cemetery, county general, road, library, EMS, all of those different districts. We have 62 tax code areas. So every time a district overlaps, it creates a new tax code area that the landowners within that area pays into. 
Um, some taxing districts receive assessed value from all parcels within the county. So it doesn't matter where you're at, you're gonna be paying taxes into that district. That value of that entire county is going to be used in, in creating your levy rates and your, your budgets. The county general is the best example of every taxable parcel within Klickitat County pays into the county general tax district. Um, ones that are examples of smaller districts are like a fire district. If you're within a fire district, it, the district has a boundary, you pay into just that fire district. Fire districts don't overlap. Um, so if you have a project that's being built or a home that's being built within say fire seven, that's the local district here around Goldendale, they are going to get the value of that new construction to increase their budget by. The county is going to as well, but fire district six, five, two, whatever it is, they're not going to get any increase based on that project. It just depends on what your total district is. Um, so an example of a, what we call a new construction bump or an increase in your budget for a taxing district is the county general. I'm using simple round numbers. These are not exact. Let's pretend that the county's current budget is 4.5 million and the new construction value for all taxable parcels within the county is 40 million. You take the 40 million times your prior year's levy rate, so let's pretend it's $1.26, that gives you $50,759.66 that you can add to your budget. Your 1% would be $45,000. So if you had a $4.5 million budget, you add your 1%, which is 45,000, your 50,000 and change new construction value, your new amount that you could have for taxes is $4,595,759 and change. So that's your, and I didn't include state assessed in there because it's, it's always a, you know, you, you might get it, you might not get it. Um, but you can always ask for your 1% and you can always ask for your new construction. So that's kind of the increases that a taxing district is allowed uh, to have. Can I kind of question right there? Yeah. Um, the new construction bump, let's say you use an example of 4.5 million, I think is what you said. That was the budget. What, 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 would you, what did you say the new construction bump was in your little theory? <laughs> Whatever so is. if if we had a forty million dollar new construction value, then you times that by last year's levy rate, so that would equal fifty thousand seven hundred fifty nine dollars. Is it possible that that taxing district, whatever we're talking about, which I think you're using the general for mm -hmm. this, um, loses that dollar amount of bump next year? That that number should stay the same no. because that value is still out there, or would no. they lose that bump? Well, it's it's not that you're losing it; it's that. So now for next year, your um, budget is that new number is that plus one percent plus one percent plus the new construction that for year. That year, yeah. But the but, fifty thousand dollars is now part of your total assessed value, and that is used to set your levy rate. Right. So that year. amount of bump. Mm -hmm. That you got, whatever that is, let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars just to be thrown up. Next year you're gonna have another new construction bump. This last part that changed your budget is now gonna be picked up by the general public. Yes. To get to that number. Yes. So when whenever so the new construction bump essentially the first time is paid for by the development or the new construction. Well, and after that, it's picked up by the taxpayer. The tax, so that that's, so the taxes themselves are going to come from that increase in that value, which is from that development. So if if a person so the development would be a taxpayer, yeah, in that 
theory of who pays for that after that. Okay. Right, because after that, now they're just part of that big assessed value. Okay. Okay. And they're still gonna pay the taxes. So let's say you had a, a new house, you know, that was a million dollar house. The first year, um, you're gonna increase your new construction by, you know, whatever the, for that taxpayer, they're gonna pay that taxes on that million dollars. But, and then the next year, if it's still a million dollars, they're still gonna be paying taxes on a million dollars. I think we're, because we're, the agenda item is on energy projects. So what happens though is, is, so you create the new bump, so you set a new floor, and we're bringing in this much money, right? You've increased, you know, the overall, in essence, value of the county by a certain amount. Of the taxing district. Of, of that. Now, but now, you also as, increase the budget. You've also increased the budget, but now, like, if you build a house, the houses tend to only go up in value. Well, except for in a recession. Except for in a recession, but <laughs> during overtime, though. Yeah. But on the other hand, an energy project that's being taxed as personal property depreciates over the course of fifteen years or so, and so you set a new a new base floor. We're bringing in as much money. The value of the county went up, but as that depreciates down, everybody else is picking up the difference. Correct. Right. So the other thing with um, so wind and solar, and and I can talk quite a bit about wind because we've you know we have a history of wind. So it doesn't only depreciate. So let's say you have a hundred million dollar project that went in. That original hundred million dollars is going to depreciate, but if they repower, if they install new motors, engines, blades, if they're, you know, if they do anything new like that, then they report that value, that increases their assessed value, and that starts the depreciation of those items at that year. Right. So unfortunately, the increase in, you know, like all of their repairs and their maintenance, um, does not keep up with the depreciation for wind. I I have no idea. The solar, I don't. How much maintenance or whatever my solar is going to have? Is there's not going to be as much maintenance or upgrading of you know because they're not changing out motors and blades and I think once the panels are there, the panels they might are change there. out panels though because um, the efficiency and the the quality and um, of panels is an ever changing. Um, it's kind of like computers, like it's changing continually. So Lund Hill, when it was originally proposed, they kind of said we might have a single, and I can't remember the exact word for it, we might have a single face panel, we might have bifacial panels, we might have solid set panels, we might have rotating panels. Um, because they wanted to be able to keep up with when they actually started installing the panels, they wanted to be able to have the most current most efficient right. so they're ending up with um bifacial rotating panels right my thinking though and this is just i guess i'd say if i was putting in if i put solar panels on my house i'm not going to tear them off in five years and put the the newest technology up that's there, different though it's not a business money. um i would be highly surprised uh if a solar development changed panels at least within the first 10 to 15 years well, we have because had, they're only losing three percent productivity, or. Um, but how do we know that with the ever-changing um, uh, panels? I mean, we don't know, right? I mean, right now it might be that they're they're only getting better by three percent, but in five years down the road, we don't know. So, as far as the wind facilities, we have had one facility that's done a total retrofit. Um, they increase their capacity, um, their generating capacity within the, you know, last few years. I don't know the exact increase in value of that because it's a state assessed um, entity, uh, the, the one that's retrofitted. So, uh, you know, we have within, what, 10, 15 years, 15 years maybe, done a retrofit on a, on a wind. So. Right, uh, Chris, if I could hop in there, I'd, I'd say, yeah, I think we were surprised that we've had uh, repowers in wind farms that was, I mean, it was ahead of 
what we anticipated we would likely see for this very same reasons that we're like, well, it's a huge capital investment. You know, they're not going to go and do that until the project's pretty depreciated. And as you said, we've already seen one where I think they were only, you know, six or seven years in and they did this major uh, remodel. So it is possible. I, I would say with solar, we don't know right. uh, what that's going to look like as, as technology gets better. Can you talk little bit about because we are you know we were kind of focused I, I like the the background information as far as how um how all the assessments and stuff work are we going to have a chance today sometime to talk about solar specifically and then what the as you said we only have one permitted project in the county at this point what the methodology as far as uh for the assessment it's likely that either you or the state is going to use if they're going to be state assessed if it's going to be the same you know is it is it going to be the uh, cost approach or is it going to be income or so I, I don't know if you were prepared today hopefully at least we can start a conversation about that because I think that's that's a particular interest to folks at least it is to me as we look at more of these projects in the county I was actually done with my um, little spiel. I interrupted you right at the end. Yeah, so um, yeah, and I, I expected to have some questions. One of the reasons why I went into a basic overview of real and personal property, because I answered the solar questions within my presentation. So the WAC defines personal property as machinery and equipment of any commercial or industrial business which operates on leased land. So solar facilities operate on leased land. Because they are on leased land, they are personal property. Personal property is assessed on the cost approach typically and depreciated according to the lifespan of um, the, that type of item with average maintenance. So solar will be like wind, they will be assessed at the cost approach um, and then updated periodically as they do, you know, maintenance and, and uh, whatnot. Do we know what the depreciation term will be? It is the same as um, it's on the same uh, trend as um, uh, the wind turbines. So it's the 8.5 um, trend table, yeah. So over how many years is that? Uh... Um, I do have that. Here, I thought I was all labeled nicely so I could just grab it right out. Well, I warned you that I would send you all my questions well, beforehand and I didn't, so my- And I try to anticipate that, you know, like having a lot of questions. So I believe so they're, so few. I believe they're at like 18 years, if I'm right. Um, and then they'll go down to the residual 15% of value and, until, you know, that original value, that original installation value will go down to 15%, but then you have the other things that they've added on throughout that years. I, I believe it's 18. Okay, good enough. Okay, so- I do have that. So let's just play this out. Uh, we've got um, a very large potential project to pump storage on the order of 1200 megawatts, a couple billion dollar project. We've got solar panel projects potentially coming in. Um, and as the best way I understand it is when somebody builds a new project, it sets the new floor for what we're going to get as a county. Yay for us as a county, new floor. But every year, each one of those projects depreciates down eight and a half percent, which means the rest of the county has to make up that difference to that new flow. And I think the pump storage project is probably going to be a combination of different ways of assessment because you have you have the wind component of it, um, right? Because aren't they going to use the wind turbines to pump the water back up? No. They'll buy it at the market at the cheap and then they'll pump it, you know, pump okay. the water off. So there's there's no way. So so I guess I guess where I'm going with this. And a pump storage project 
is not within the RCWs right now. So there's no pump storage project where your wind and solar there within the RCWs on how to be assessed, um, lifespan, that kind of stuff. A pump storage project is not in there. So I don't know if, and when I say they're not in there, they're not in there as far as if the new construction bump is going to be allowed for them. Because typically personal property is, is not incorporated into new construction at all. But uh, when Van was first, um, you know, working on how to assess wind turbines and all that, you also had your uh, uh, representatives um, wanting to give the taxing districts a, a piece of that value. And so new legislation was written to um, allow wind, solar, and biomass values to be included in new construction. I do not, I mean, I have calculated a proposed new construction value as an estimate for people because I was requested that, but there's no guarantee at this point that it is going to have a new construction value. So, so if it doesn't have a new construction value, then the rest of the community won't pick up that eight and a half percent of it depreciates down. Well, yeah, the, it'll just, it'll have a value and that value will be used in calculating your rate, right? So let's say it's uh, what was it like two and a half billion? Was that one, one, sure. to one and a half to two and a half billion? It's two bill for pump storage. So if you take and so right now we're at yeah, like three, I can't remember exactly, three point some billion dollar total assessed value, total taxable value uh, within the county. If you add another two billion to that, if the levy rate right now for the county general is $1.26, you know, you're adding another two billion to that. That's going to drop that levy rate if, if you don't get a new construction. Bond. If you don't get a new construction. And that'll be paid by everybody. So every parcel will receive a benefit from something like that they'll, that doesn't have a new they'll construction. They'll be receiving, they'll be paying less taxes yeah. on it. The levy rate will be, I'm not going to say less taxes because you, you know, you don't know what people's values are, but I would say their le the levy rate would go down. The yes. levy rate will go down to them, but if, if that's the case, then the amount of income that the county gets doesn't go up. It would not increase by a new construction. It would not increase. Yeah. yeah. So right. it wouldn't just a really new construction bump, it would be the 1%. Yeah. It would, yeah, which in essence, we get no gain from it, practically. On a budget overall. The taxing district would not. Right. That's right. Dave's other question was um, state or local assessed. Lund Hill will be locally assessed. Okay. Um, you have, is that going to be your thought moving forward with other solar projects? It's not my thought. It's how, it's how they are set up in ownership. So if Lund Hill, the Lund Hill LLC entity, put in a solar facility in Prosser County, they're now crossing county lines, they would be status, they could be state assessed and more than likely would be. But because most of your energy facilities, they create an entity that owns each facility, it's typically locally assessed. So even pump storage for the most part would be. Well, there isn't any other pump storages in Washington State, is there? There may be one, but. It's, it's government owned, so okay. it's on Bank Lake, so it's not, it's part of the uh, um, Grand Coulee Dam and the, the that, then it's no. So no, for your, for your um, example, no, this would be the only uh, privately constructed pump storage project in the state. But it also depends upon the ownership. So let's say that, um, let's say, Avangrid, for example, let's say they bought into and they became the owners of the pump storage project. And let's say they have one in California, they'd be stated. Right. Uh, it's, it's all about the, the so, ownership of the so entity. So that's how the landfill essentially, because they're- The landfill is not state assessed. I thought the landfill was state assessed. No, I assessed it. That's right. Yeah. So I'm going off the wrong information in my head the whole time. Okay, so looking forward and knowing knowing where this county is going um, and knowing that these are depreciating down. If you set, a, I mean, if it goes on personal property and it currently gets a bump to what we bring in per year uh, because it's new construction. And if we do that with pump storage, it would be a really big bump for the county in cash receipts year one. 
and then that would set the new level and we'll, we'll continue making that money yay for us being commissioners and dealing with it well you can continue to make that money there's nothing that says that just because you can you can ask for it that you have to but then of course we all know that it always continually takes more money. well yeah and everything costs more money so it's yeah. great but if, as that depreciates down eight and a half percent each year we've, we've in essence added 40 percent of the value to the county yeah everybody else in the county makes up that difference as that's depreciating down that to me is, is a worry it's a long-term worry it's the same right. thing with solar it's a long-term worry so, so the question i have is is i know what oregon did and, and what oregon's done is, is for their renewable energy they just set a value per megawatt that you pay and then that gets divvied out amongst all the junior taxing districts and everything like that for itself. I'll assess them however legislature proposes. And, but again, though, since we are the renewable capital of the Northwest in essence right now currently, and there's talk uh, you know, with the Bi-State Renewable Energy Group, um, is that a direction that we would like to go in order to protect our citizens so that we can get the, the tax revenue off these pro projects without having the citizens after 15 years being fitting the bill as they're still making income off the project uh, so that's that's one of the directions i think it would be good for us in the long-range planning with the legislature on how do we want to protect our citizens i mean you all can propose and whatever you all would like <laughs> that's not part of what my duties are my duties are take what legislature passes what is in law and process values and levy rates that way right. and but my question i guess would be to, to maybe help you or maybe i guess trips me up um, with your three ways of assessing uh, sale cost or income wouldn't if you were assessing based on income be kind of exactly what he's talking about because you're accessing it based off the income they're making on the kilowatts there. But it's producing. different, they don't own the land. So it, it's kind of how the business is set up as well on what approach that you use. So, Krista, yeah. I in there. She needs a drink. Because the same. So are you prohibited when you say generally the cost approach is used on, you know, if it's on leased, you know, so these projects, that's and that is what you have used and are required to use, I guess, on wind and would have the same, you know, because the solar seems like it fits all the same definitions and you would. Is that in the RC, like you don't have any flexibility, you're required to use the cost approach no. or can it an income approach? No, I'm not required. Um, but the other thing we have to look at is we do do some income approaches for uh, commercial properties within our county. Income approach is a very, 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 very complicated approach. Sounds simple, but it isn't. And typically, if we were to have a entity with the types of values that wind and solar has at an income approach, I would either need to hire somebody to do that valuation each year, or I would have to um request a courtesy appraisal from the department of revenue to achieve those values um they're they have to be over 10 million dollars in industrial property in order for the department of revenue to assist us okay which all of these sound like they would well yeah for that. yeah um they would and because my biggest worry is exactly, I guess, what he's talking about is the long-term cost shift. And it isn't just us. I can't imagine you're going to give a, a budget increase to Rural 7 and then two years from now, you're, okay, we're going to lower that back down. Actually, they do. That. Your fire districts, your cemetery districts, um, some of those districts, they either don't ask for everything that they can ask for or they limit that they they'll ask for it so that it can go in their bucket but they don't then they limit themselves by one of the criterias within this binder that allows them to do that so, so i'm be hearing rumbling of um 
call this uh, fire district um, consolidation. consolidation so that they can all share in a piece of rural seven soon to be wealth. Well, I mean, there's a whole process that has to happen if, if when you have districts, I haven't done a district consolidation before. I've done a district that annexed land from the surrounding area into it. Um, I, I went off topic, but anyway, yes, no, the major concern is that I've always had is the depreciation uh, approach to humongously valued properties. In the so I guess I guess where I'm coming from, Krista, is my goal as always is reoccurring revenue that has no cost shift burden to the taxpayers of the county. Well, you're always going to have a cost shift. I mean, always. Every time legislature passes an increase in um, exemptions, right. it's going to be a, There's always going to be that shift. And, I mean, and I'm, I'm talking with regards to this renewable energy, these large projects. And, and you're an elected official, and I know your duty is just to do what the legislature tells you to do, but you're also an elected official just like us, and it's how do we get to that point where we're not shifting the burden from these large projects onto the taxpayers to make up the difference. And the cost, the cost or the income-based approach, correct? Mm -hmm. Then that does it. If you do an income-based approach right off the start, you're not adding the the, the new construction value. You would still add a new construction value. You would still add the It new doesn't matter how you value something that is allowed to be used as a new construction bump. It doesn't matter which approach it's used. So it's, it's the type of property it is. So real property, you're always allowed to use that new construction bump for all real property. Personal property, typically you do not, you're not allowed to get a new construction bump except solar, wind, and biomass. Right. So the, the how I value it doesn't have anything to do with new construction. Yeah, I have um... It would change the depreciation type aspect of it, yes, but it, it wouldn't change whether they got a new construction, whether they whether their value was included in a new construction bump or not. Can the how you value change during the life of a project? Can the project yes. start as a cash base and then two years later go, whoa, this is a bad idea, switch to income? So you can change your methodology of assessing property. Uh, wind is a perfect example. Um, when we first, because we're leading county, in renewable energies. Wind, we did not have any in Washington state. So Van did tons of research, talked to everybody he could. Department of Revenue did not have a rec recommended methodology at that time for wind. So he determined he was going to assess it based on so much a megawatt for a certain amount of years, and then they would relook at it. Um, after a few years down the road, then you know, at Department of Revenue, they caught up, the legislature, RCWs, everything were changed and amended. And um, the Department of Revenue came up with the cost approach to uh, valuing, you know, basically wind, solar, and, and biomass. Primarily, they really concentrated on wind at that time. Now they're doing a, they're doing a study this year on a methodology for um, moving forward for solar. So when um, after a few years after the Department of Revenue came up with that methodology, the assessor at the time changed the way um, the wind facilities were being assessed. It was a huge deal. It was very big. It changed a tremendous amount of value. Um, but because it wasn't, it was no longer new construction value, even though there was a huge increase in the first year's value, none of that was used for new construction. It was that original value that Van had placed on in the first year the wind facilities became online. So you're saying right now, the way the, the legislature and the Department of Revenue have it is you're supposed to be using cost for solar and wind. 
That is the recommended methodology. Recommended. Which is important for you. Well, it's important to have a, a I'll say a dark gray, because there's not really black and white process. Because if I say I chose to do it based on an income approach, the Department of Revenue, because there is a recommended methodology out there, they're going to continue because they audit me on right. all of my values periodically. So they're going to continue to do the cost approach. If they don't mesh, then we have to figure out a way to, um, to explain to each other and to see the difference because the ratio that I'm given for audits, whether it's personal property, real property, um, that is used in calculating the state school levy rate. So if I'm using an income approach and I'm putting it at you know, $100 million and the Department of Revenue is using a cost approach and they're putting it at 75 million, they're gonna say I'm over assessing it or vice versa. And it, and- It sounds like to me, Plus that, you guys would have to give me more money in my budget. The answer <laughs> to protect our citizens from possibly fitting the bill later is to make a legislative change. Well, it would be more of a Department of Revenue, really. Or, the, or making if you the look, legislator make the Department of Revenue. Yeah, because if you look at legis the legislature says I that, that unique properties can be by cost or income. I mean, they can still be by sales as well, but... If I own a piece of property that I'm making thousands of dollars a year on a on a solar lease, I'm not going to sell that property. And if I, you know, because I've got that income coming in, so we're not we we wouldn't be able to use the sales approach, right. you know. Um, right. So but that kind of brings up another question for landowners mm -hmm. that are leasing. Mm -hmm. um, is their dirt property going to be assessed at income approach because of the income they're making on their dirt now over what they made growing? So we can't do the cost approach because how do you cost approach dirt, right? right? Once again, we're probably not going to have the sales because who's going who's gonna to sell an income producing right. property like that? So it More leaves us it with the income, income approach. Well, that solves half of my problem. I just got to figure out how to solve the other half. Of but with that problem. income approach, because you know they're in, they're not allowed to disclose how much they're making on it. You have to go off of kind of like with with the 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 rest of it. What the DNR is doing, right? Since or, we're a government entity, I would believe that they would be allowed to provide that information to us. Um, they they give it to the IRS. Yeah, you can't right? not so, taxing representatives. So that, if I'd have known that, I wouldn't have let him visit my house last week. We'd just stand out the road and say, man, everything is high quality on Mr. Christopher's property. <laughs> no. So I would so, imagine they're gonna have to. So um, any income that is provided to our office is confidential. It is not, it is not open for the public dis disclosure. We have um, senior citizens and disabled people's income. We have um, farmers' incomes. All of that is confidential. You know, if if I'm leasing a piece of property from you know Mr. Anderson and and you know, I've got a heck of a deal at let's say a hundred bucks an acre or whatever. And, you know, I don't want someone else that wants to lease his property to find out that I'm only paying a hundred bucks because then they'll come and offer 300. So it's all proprietary and confidential. I know they've signed agreements. I have talked to um, the Avon Grid regarding their agreements. Um, they did not tell me I cannot have they also didn't state I could. So, um, so Chris, so can, can I ask a question about that? Then is yeah. that to 
So let's say I have a 160 acre parcel that I, you know, formerly was growing wheat on. And now I have a solar lease that's going to pay me, you know, $1,000 an acre, and, you know, so I'm going to generate $160,000. Is that going to change the value of that land as far as for tax assessment purposes? Yeah, I mean, I would, even, yeah, even, I would hope so. Even if we didn't do an income approach, it's still going to change the value of that land because 160 acres growing wheat is more than likely in the open space farm program. And they're paying taxes based on the land's ability to grow that wheat, the right. income, the expenses, or lease, or the lease process. So, right. yeah, uh, it uh, is yeah. going to increase the landowner's value. And they have to pull it out of current use. And they right. yeah. So, but if, but my question is, if it's not in, so it, like I could, if I was the wheat farmer and I could decide, or, you know, I'm not growing wheat anymore and it gets pulled out of a uh, current use program, it's going to have a value placed on that. And I'm going to have to pay for that. Yeah. That is likely that's going to be significantly less than what it's worth getting a thousand dollars an acre. So that's my question. Are we going to yes. have an that is going to be different than just the general not in the program value. Yeah, because typically, so once again, we assess property at its highest and best use. So right. if, if, if property isn't in a farm program, what's its highest and best use? Typically, it's residential. Um, well, but it can be um, commercial if the zoning allows it. Um, it could be industrial, like in the situation of, you know, um, the, like the landfill. The landfill had property that was in farm and ag. It was grazed. As they move the, um, the, the area that they are piling the garbage into, as they move it onto new areas of their property, it comes out of the program. Their... Um, their uh, assessment, highest and best use is commercial. So, so when you pull it out, you're, you're pulling it out for a reason. And if it's- Because it no be, longer complies with the no program. Longer complies. Mm -hmm. And so if you know what the income is on that property, the highest and best use of it is the solar panels. And then you figure, I don't know what it, whatever it was, say $1,000 an acre, right? Mm -hmm. is, is what the income based off of that. So when you pull it out, you have to pay the difference between between what you were paying per acre, and then you can figure out a thousand dollars. No, no, acre. you cannot correct. use the no, when you pull oh, it out. no. So use? under the Open Space Act, we are required by law to carry two values. We carry one value that's market highest and best use. We carry another value that's what we call the current use value. So that's a land's ability to grow, graze, whatever it is. Those values each year are sent out to the landowner. They can appeal them separately, combine whatever. Those existing values are what's used for open space removals. Okay. So it's the highest and best use, so market value. I was gonna say, they don't have to pay the income on solar for the past seven, that would be unfair to them. However, let's pretend that you have a forest parcel out there and you're gonna take it out, clear cut it, put panels on it. That's different. So what's the current market of that parcel right now? That is the current market value minus the forest value for compensating taxes. That one's different. Hmm. But we probably still wouldn't use that thousand dollars an acre because more than likely at the time they would take something like that out. At the very, very beginning. It's at the savings. very beginning, and we have no idea, and it's not being valued that way. You know, like the current value isn't that. Okay. See how easy our job is? Yeah. You have to have data to quantify what you're going to apply. So if there is no data to apply it, at a different method, I guess. So even if the Department of Revenue switched and with solar and as it said no more cost we recommend you do income you would then be sitting before us asking for help in order to do income come budget time i would be sitting before you and asking for money to hire a consultant 
that's probably going to be from Texas to value something like this. Yes. If you're, if you're valuing it based on income, mm -hmm. and shouldn't the company be able to provide you their gross income? Yes, but there's things that are not allowed. There's things that even though, you know, it's just not their income. It's, it's their income, it's a capitalization rate. There's things that you can reduce their income by, you know, it's not just the gross income, it ends up being like a net. Oh, it's based on, it's more of a net income. Yeah, and I don't know, that's not exactly the correct word, but it's not their gross income. Because if you're losing money on it, then you wouldn't pay taxes. Well, I said like, not yeah. exactly. <laughs> Right. So, so it's kind of like a senior exemption. This is simplifying it. But so when you have a senior exemption, you have, this is how much money your household has coming in for the IRS. There's all kinds of things that you can write off, but for the senior exemption, there isn't, you know, there's just a few things that you can reduce your income by for that qualification. So income approach, and that's very simplifying it. In income approach is very, it's, it's not, it's very complex. It's a very complex process. So probably the easiest thing, if we were to spend county political will moving forward would be something to go down like what Oregon did where they will pay base per megawatt, something very simple and then that gets split up. And then our constituents will never have to fit that bill. In essence, it's these large projects are bonuses to to what the county brings in in tax revenue rather than offsetting what other people can pay. I mean, the other thing, and I know we've had this conversation and you keep kind of, you, you come back to me and say the same thing I say to you is that it costs more to run the government every year. You cannot take the new construction bump. Therefore, that budget does not get distributed the following year out to everybody. If you didn't take, if you did not take that bump, except Krista, could, you know, <laughs> that view of like we can control whether we take it for the county general fund, the county, correct, we, not for like state school right. those levies we can't not well, take the, that. The state so, school doesn't get a new construction bump. They don't. No. Wow, didn't know that one either. No, it, it's a total different calculation. Okay. But okay. all the other taxing districts do. Either and, way, I think we right. so I mean, ultimately we the only part of that that we control is the part that we directly levy, yep. which is our your county general code and, and your county, county general. That's yes. all. And so if you know, based on my tax bill, that's about you know maybe a third to a little depending, you know, it's district by district, depending on how many other taxing districts there are. So that's the maximum amount of impact that we could have as far as the county could have. The decisions are with all the other entities. Yeah, currently it would be like a dollar twenty-six per thousand, you right. know, for the the out of nine to eleven dollar average right. um, tax code area levy rate. That that right. you know that the taxpayer wouldn't have to pay. Yes, right. I mean I I honestly I'm just going to do whatever is recommended by the revenue service <laughs> or by us. Which but I, I I get and it is for us, but this is I mean these these big projects in rural counties that is the the danger of them is yeah. they are. They are a long-term liability, potential liability to the, the the remaining the you know I'll call them the normal taxpayers um, because they depreciate over time. Yeah. And that's and a good example is so you look at the the Bickleton area tax code areas that had the majority of or a lot of the wind facilities on them. Prior to the wind facilities, their levy rates were three dollars and something, because everybody's budgets got increased by the value of those wind facilities, and those wind facilities are reducing in value. The levy rates are now six and seven dollars. Right. So it it That's does. That's what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's what I would yeah. like for us to try to avoid. I understand her doing what the state department of revenue requests or 
but it's all they give her but we should be trying to push for some political clout to get them to protect our people if we're going to be eating their green energy projects so it's not just their recommended methodology it's also something that is maintainable and that we can do with mass appraisal so um if, if we're you know if we're needing to have all of these facilities and we have a lot of, of of energy facilities in our county if we if if the methodology changes you know it needs to be a change that we can do with the staff that we have you know or a consultant but there's not a lot of them out there right but it's like what you said with bickleton if the levy rate yeah. went from three to six that's double if we end up 10 years from now ended up boom double everybody's taxes here it's going to be a lot of unhappy people because we did not have the forethought to try to push through yeah. and make those um yeah and i don't want to be a part of that so so i guess I I guess looking at, is there any way that you could work up um, something that shows how when wind came in, here was the levy rate, and now, you know, keeping things equal, this is what the levy rate I tried is. to do that six years ago, you know, like saying, okay, this is what wind did, this is what would happen if we hadn't had it. And because once again, this is my levy book. It got too difficult. It, well, and it's not just too difficult. It's just there's there's entirely too many moving parts. Right. There's only um, so much time in a day to yeah. That would be a lot of hours. Yeah, I and and I spent a lot of time working on it because I wanted to know and I wanted to see, and um, there there's just too there, and I tried to make it simple where I only used you know like two taxing districts as an example of what what would it look like and maybe i don't know maybe if i throw them all in there it would be you know easier but i'm not a i'm not that type of a statistician so i guess i guess though if we would have stuck with vans way of assessing based on the income based method when we built those schools the school out there right and they agreed to, you know, we got all this new money coming in. It's going to be, you know, it's it's on the income-based method. It'll it'll keep us making this much money. Everybody's taxes shouldn't go up. Yeah, and you can't make that promise. So so what happened with that is you still have all the other moving parts. So the levy rate, there was only one year where the rate was at what everybody in that area was promised it would be at and that year was the first year mm -hmm. that the prior that darlene put the wind turbines on there at the current methodology which was the cost approach so and after that the labor it goes up as they depreciate correct but it was already up <laughs> because that value was already added into the district's budgets It was it had already been going up from Van's methodology on the income. Well, yeah, because the 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 new construction still, you know, the when they brought the the turbines online and they were assessed at 100 percent, that new construction value was still included in the district's values, which increased their budget capacity and they took it. So it, the the rate even under Van still increased. Now the the depreciation of the equipment would not have been as much. And so maybe the levy rate would have went down or been static or something. I mean, I, I don't know because there's just still too many, but they took that bump and that's what resets the levy rate. Yes, but, but <laughs> if I, if, <laughs> if my house, you know, when I built my, the new place it went on there that increased the tax revenue. My house is likely next year is going to be valued at the same or more. Or more. Appreciate well, more than like yeah. Thank you. Right. So <laughs> so, so so all things equal, I'm probably going to pay about the same share into the 
all the different levies that I did this year. But if I have my neighbor's place that built this giant mansion that was worth a hundred million dollars and it, they pay taxes on a hundred million dollars this year. And next year we already know that that mansion is not worth a hundred million. Right. It's now worth 92 yeah. million. Yeah, the no. difference, it gets shared to me. So if we had a thing that said somehow that $100 million mansion is going to stay somewhere around $100 million for the next foreseeable future. The taxes are going to stay fairly static as far as what I'm paying and what right. they're paying. Right. And so when so, I. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not arguing that under Van's method, uh, you know, the rates were going to increase. It's just that they. Yeah, I, I don't know. And as far as your home, your home is going to depreciate. Every, everything but lands depreciates in the assessor's office. However, okay. we have a market factor adjustment for real right. property that then brings it up or down according to Depending. the market. And we do not have that for wind, solar, and biomass. Right. Well, I mean, I think we get back to the position of we need a legislative change to uh, the way the system is done, I, yeah, right? And I'm not, I'm not arguing with you. You have to do, yeah, what, or even a know. Department of Revenue methodology change, because the yeah. statute allows, the statute already allow, allows sales costs or income, but the recommended methodology from the Department of Revenue is to use the cost method. So I think it would be more of a DOR methodology change. Okay. Um, then a legislative well, change because the legislature already already has those in it and it, in fact the legislature says to do cost or income for unique properties well you just mentioned for the houses you have the whatever market factor market adjustment. factor but you don't for solar is right. that the fix if, if solar had a market factor adjustment well that would be an income approach right because it would be based on the market trying to figure out which yeah. direction we should be pushing. Yeah. To, to so when, sure when, we the... when we assess the winds, there's a couple things that happen. So we assess the megawatts, right? So their, their production, like let's say they're doing 100 megawatts, we assess so much per megawatt. So they get that assessment and then they get everything else that they pay into as well. And all of that depreciates. So that they are being assessed on, on their megawatts as well, not just their equipment. But the megawatts depreciate? The, that value of that, in, of that initial installation, yes. Right, so that's yeah. your initial value, that's your initial bump. You figure $2 million a megawatt, we're just throwing numbers out there. Yes, 2.5. Okay, $2.5 million yeah. a megawatt. You look at the overall value of it and you say, this is the this new construction cost. No, that's one component. So we, we put all of that on, on the value as well as everything else that they have. So- Everything else such as? Everything else, such as their studies for archaeology, for WDFW, their expense for their EIS, their their chairs, their computers, their of course they go at a different rate, but right. um, everything that it costs that facility to produce electricity is assessed. Um, I'm trying to think of other things. Their road construction costs, their foundations, their equipment, everything is included in there. That's not factored into the two and a half million dollars? No. 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 So where do you come up with the two and a half million per WEGWA? You that? are. Yeah, that's another interesting one there. Just playing with some math. Well, I'm saying even the approach we do it now is not simple. <laughs> right. And we never said it was. Yeah. You're, you're trying to educate yeah. the the people that don't know your job right. into how we can possibly better protect our yeah. citizens going forward. 
uh, and or get the best bang for well, the, the other, out of the development. The other thing on the income approach that I think would probably level it out is that all, all of the wind facilities, and I know Lund Hill, they all have PP&A, so they already have purchase power agreements. So they already know how much they're going to get a megawatt, mm -hmm. you know, for a certain amount of time. And I, I don't remember how long their, their PP&A agreements are. We do have one wind facility that does not have one. And so they're mm -hmm. at the mercy of the market and therefore they have a lower value. Um, so, uh, I mean, yeah. And, and so maybe doing it that way, you know, would, would lend that. Well, that's I mean, that's the what problem we want. Would be is the we want flat. Because yeah. I, I remember when, when Van first said, you know, he, he had the option of assessing it either way. He said, it, Well, there wasn't any options. He went out there and tried to find the best way to right. assess it. He them. had options finding the best way. Yeah. And he went to the meeting. And I remember sitting in the meeting. And he said, Look, I could do it this way. And we get a whole bunch of money this year. And then we're going to get less and less and less and less money from the winter recovery. Mm -hmm. The county yeah. gets the same amount. Right, the budget does, yes. The Your, budget gets the yeah, same the amount, taxing district. But, yeah. but, the, but they would pay less and less. And he said yeah. the best way we can do it, so because he knew that we have to make up the difference, we a regular taxpayer. Yeah. He said, we, we want to keep it flat or yeah. as close to flat. And then, you know, with a with a purchase power agreement, right, it's, it's flat. Yeah. If you're at the mercy of the smart market, when prices are high one year, just like, you know, you know, we don't know exactly what we're going to get from the landfill based on how much comes in. Yeah. And so that was the idea to keep it flat that protected the people. No, I, I was it. worked in the assessor's office when right. Van did this. So I'm right. aware and, of and, all the and discussions. So that made that made logical sense mm -hmm. to the people that were the, the projects were getting sold to. Mm -hmm. We're not going to fit the bill. He assessed it similar to uh, the power plants that are that own both the infrastructure as well as the land right yes right yeah. because and i'm not saying either way is right or wrong i mean i'm just saying that if we have to do the income approach you know the other thing that we have with uh wind and a potential income approach would be when they get shut down because of uh you know too much water and they've got to be producing the power through the yeah, hydro uh that way i don't know i mean i I don't know are they going to do that with solar as well i mean i don't i don't know so that would be you know you would have to have some type of criteria in your formula for i guess like hotels where you know you have a vacancy vacancy rate or it would be a you know non-power producing i mean there, there there would there would be other things in there um which i guess if you're if it would be the income it would be the past year so that would be known mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, there, there, it's not something that anybody within my office would have the ability to do or has ever had the ability to do in such a small county. You, you're not going to get somebody right. here with that knowledge. It's like having um, a webmaster. Right. Well, and I don't want <laughs> someone here doing that job because they're probably not competent to do that job. So well, if we hired they, them, they would be competent. Otherwise, we wouldn't hire them. Well, if you hire well, <laughs> if you if you hired them and they already knew that job, maybe. I mean, but we when Dan when Van was here, we were doing the income based approach on on wind turbines, correct? No, what he did is he he just no n not a full income approach. What he, I mean, in a way it was, so what he did is he stated, okay, so similar to a power plant, they're producing so many megawatts of power, you assume it's so much per megawatt, wham, that's your value. That is not a true income approach to value. But we can't do that the way he did it? So... <laughs> 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 Not to put you on the spot. So, so a perfect example is let's say that you're building a a um a five million dollar home and we have no way to calculate a value of a five million dollar home because we don't have any sales of five million dollar homes. So we do the best that we can and we say, you know what, we're going to put you at 3.75 because we have sales pretty close to that. Are you going to appeal your value? 
Heck no. no. It's less than what it paid. Absolutely. No, you're not. No, no, absolutely. I was agreeing. Right. <laughs> but if I go ahead and put you at that five, you don't want to pay the taxes on that. So you're going to appeal that value. How am I going to defend that? I have no sales. We can say, okay, it costs this much to build a five million dollar home, but we don't, you know, we've done a market factor adjustment because that's how we assess that kind of property, you know. So we did. So my 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 point is, is I I think van was great. I'm not dishing van at all, but they could have had a lot higher value if a full income approach was done and they all would have appealed it. I can guarantee you. Well, they're probably happiest right now as they depreciate every year. Well, they weren't when it first changed to that. Well, yeah, because now, <laughs> of course you're not the first year. They now. appealed, uh, one of the facilities did appeal. So we worked our way through that, but. Right. But, um, but as time goes on, they get happier, yeah. right? You're still making good money. It's depreciated down. You're making but good money. They're, Everybody else is paying today. They're, they're also improving their properties. So, I mean, I don't know if they're happy or not. I mean, I, I, I honestly, wh whether somebody I assess is happy or not is not what I use to assess them with. It's am I doing, you know, consistent fair assessment? And for me, I guess I would say just to give you a, where my train of thought is. Um, if, if me as a caretaker and a receiver of some of the funds coming from these green energy projects that gets to distribute some of the funds received from these green energy projects, if hiring somebody to keep our citizens protected 15 years from now, uh, will be at the front of my argument list on where to spend. The funds coming. Yeah, so that, that's a future discussion, but uh, if you so I know you've been attacked, just like the rest of us have recently, over many different things. Uh, one of that is the valuation on Mont Hill. We're recording this yep. people are going to watch it people thought it was going to be at one o'clock i can't wait for them to go and watch it uh, <laughs> lund hill isn't built right okay you can't assess lund hill and the cost until it's built correct 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 did you say the date was like july july 31st july? july 31st is when we pick up new for construction what's done this year so far so right. they've got some posts in the ground well we don't assess posts we so they do have some um office trailers or construction yeah. trailers they yeah. do have some things like that that we will be picking up this year um when i talked to the general manager he said they're they're producing electricity deadline is now 12 31 of this year of this year okay. so we so will, next year they're not going to pay hardly anything because they don't have a gun anything built before july right the year after that Right. But but next July, you should be able to, to we'll know. We'll pick them up at 100 percent. Yes. Pick them up at 100 yes. percent. You'll know what the cost is so you can give an estimate. We would more than likely know April 30th. Right. And, yes. and the okay. reason I'm bringing this up recorded is so that I know everybody says I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I don't know because it doesn't exist and I'm not required to. I mean, we we know what the company has said or an estimate uh, you know their estimated value or whatnot i mean we do know those things but i try not to deal in the hypothetical you know because if you when when you do that when you say well you know if we, they're saying it's going to be at this value if you take this year's levy rate it's going to give you this much money People hold you to that, and it doesn't matter if you put estimate this big on a piece of paper or draft or whatever it is. They hold you to that, so I'm not going to do it. Right, <laughs> but you, know, you don't know what the levy rates will be. Right. You know, next year anyway. As far as there might no. be a, you know, we, a fire. I mean, somebody may change their levy rates. It's not. Yeah, you know, we start yeah. levy rates in December and have them completed by the end of January. 
right? So, um, yeah, it's not that you're not going to know what they are. It's just that it hasn't been built yet. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's not that I don't know. It's they have not been calculated. You know, right. there's, there's, I mean, you can do estimates all you want, but it, you know, and. Just wanted it on the public record. Yeah, thank you. Because well, that's I, my yeah. standard argument. That yeah, I, and it's I like I. The public yeah. record every time you said. Well, and that's my thing with the original statement of there's no such thing as an industrial rate because that's one of the things that's been thrown around out there. I actually have a paragraph that I just re copy and paste to reply to the emails when, you know, I start getting questions about an industrial rate. I know how property, whether it's the facility or the land, is required to be assessed. I know that. The values, no, we do not know that. Mm -hmm. The rates that will be used to assess taxes to their values have not been calculated yet. But I suspect we know it's not going to be zero. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, and I that mean, would be an estimate, and she doesn't deal in estimates. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, and and like um, you know, Commissioner Anderson said, we have the twelve thirty one deadline, and there, you know, the last time I spoke with them, they were working on their fencing. So, well, same deal. They only have an estimate on what they're going to spend for their fencing until it's done in the bill submitted. Yeah. So they're dealing in estimates, and then you would be dealing in estimates. So yeah. Well, I mean, they would have a feasibility study, and you, you know, give or take a certain percentage and things like that. And I mean, you know, you can do estimates. I mean, we can take that value. We can take this year's levy rates. We can do that. I try not to, just because okay, it gets so, taken out of context. So planning ahead, if we move to something more like the full income-based method. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost the county more money in order to do that. Yeah. Another option out there that, that is being discussed at the state level is moving to a megawatt cost. And this is being discussed at our state level? It's getting discussed at our state level as well. And that's for both wind and solar or all energy producing facilities? Energy producing facility per megawatt. And it might be different, you know, because uh, solar has, you know, so many an estimated number of megawatts per year, right? Mm -hmm. Versus a wind versus, you know, hydropower, you know, so there's, there'd be differences in there and those rates based on what you're doing. But in the end though, then that would in essence pretty much take us out of that because it's, it's more logical and simple. It's you pay per megawatt and then yeah. that can be adjusted by, by the legislature. And then that was one of the ways I see that could protect our citizens in the county while well, not adding to your workload. Yeah. Kind of. I guess I, I say I worry with the uh, greenies in the legislature that like to give uh, green energy projects um, freedom. Um, I worry that they would set that price per megawatt at, you know, two cents um, because it's reducing our carbon footprint. And it would actually give us a lower tax revenue than what we have now. So I do worry about that. You can develop all of the approaches to value. You can. And then you can either choose to do a combination of them all or one or the other. One or the other. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't develop all of those to see, to, to see what it would do. I mean, for me, I'm in favor. I mean, if we have to use some resources to develop that, what what I'm most interested in is what is the way that we can get the most stable uh, revenue, tax revenue from these big projects. What's the methodology that we can end up with that um, that does that? Because that, again, that the, I don't think the system was built. I, I mean, I know our tax system was not built on having you know, 30, 40, 50% of your tax base depreciating. It's, it's not set up for that. It's, it's uh, at least I don't believe so as a lay person because well, it's too uncertain. Because we didn't have that prior to. I can say, throw a $2.5 billion depreciating project in King County. They don't care. Put it here, cripple us. Right. 
you know, it's not, it's not the same. It's a, yeah, it's a small, you know, any of our projects in a big urban county with a much bigger tax base, it wouldn't be a big issue. But in a rural county where these energy projects are typically getting located because of the re that's where the resources are. It is a big, it's a, it's a problem and we need some way to fix that. And so if it's, I mean, to me, I don't know how to do it, except that if the project's generating, um, it should have, that's its value. It's, it's an energy generating project. That's its value. And if it's doing that, that's what its value is. It doesn't matter if it's 10 years from now or last week that's what its value is and it should be pretty easy um, to arrive at some reasonable average value based on the number of megawatts a project's producing uh, over the course of the year and i'm a little concerned about i know the income approach is super complicated and part of that complication though is because one entity you know we all have CPAs that can make, you know, income is a relative term, especially if it's net income. Mm -hmm. um, I see lots of businesses that on, you know, they have, they have really good accounting that, you know, they're losing money every year, yet hmm, all everything seems to be paid for and they have great brand new stuff and they don't pay any taxes. And so, um, and again, I'm not talking about assessments. That's just a general, that's yeah, just a I, general. I should not have used the word net. So that's kind of like <laughs> estimating things. It, it's, <laughs> it's just not the gross. Right. But it should be because one project, you know, if, if it's just, you know, again, it's the average where it's like, because there may be one project that their 100 megawatts they produced is more, they, it was more profitable, produced more income than 100 megawatts at a different project. But it's so you kind of average those all together and we end up some people are, you know, are, are going to be more efficient than other ones. I don't know why it needs to be so complicated. But again, that is not uh, I'm not throwing rocks at you, Krista. It's not at all. You're not the one that's made well, this I got lump growing on my head, isn't it? <laughs> <No. laughs> No, so, so the other thing to look at too is if you're, when, when you're doing the income approach for commercial or industrial properties, it's for that property. Right. It's for that facility. So, you know, if we have, I don't even know, 10, let's say we have 10 um, uh, uh, wind facilities and, you know, three solar facilities and a couple biomass facilities, you know, you're, you're going to have to do those income approach to values for yeah, all of those that's individually. That's what's already worrying me yeah. is if we Every get year. some kind of a revenue, <laughs> Department of Revenue shift to go, oh, let's switch to this little income or this megawatt well, so thing, then we got 660 windmills. Um, you're going to need more than one person. To, well, we don't have 660 facilities. Right, uh, we only have so it's groups. In it's the facility ownership. Might have 50. It's ownership, right? So we only have I don't I can't remember. There's like ten or ten or eleven, ten or eleven that, that are locally assessed, and so you would you would be appraising those, you know, every year. But the good news is, is once you get that established, then it's kind of an updated value, and and so it's a lot. It's like our current use when we started that. Um, you know, it was it was tough the first, you know few years, but it's gotten simpler with each, <laughs> I say this because Billy does that, um, with each consecutive consecutive year. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe at that point, if that's the way uh, you would do it, we could have a on staff, you know, appraiser. Um, but once you once you do it at the beginning, the first, after the first couple of years, whether it's a consultant or whatever, once you guys figure it out, it should just be updating and it should be easy. But it it is not easy. Easier <laughs> after you've done it the first couple of times. I mean, but you it's do a lot of really complex assessing. Yeah, and it and it's still a a huge process. So a, a yeah. It, it would not be something that a typical county assessor staff, like our county, would be able to maintain. 
without a, some type of specialist. It's, it's just, yes, it's simpler once you establish the, the first year, but typically with something like this, when you do the income, you do a multi-year, you know, income. And so, yeah, it's going to be easier, you know, but it's still not going to be easy. It's still going to require a consultant or a very high paid appraiser on staff to, to do. Well, I mean, how do we do the, um, the landfill? DOR does it for us. They, they do it for us. And yes. DOR could do the income method for us? Yes, but they're not going to do it every year forever. Right? So with the landfill and commercial businesses like that, that are over 10 million, they're industrial, they're very complicated. We usually get every five to 10 years an appraisal from the Department of Revenue and then we just make market adjustments. And when I say market, it's different than sales. It's just, you know, um, for like, let's say the landfill, you know, their increase in tippage, you know, they're having um, more more garbage. So we'll it's adjust. Income method, right? Yes, well, it, well it's a, it's a, a hybrid. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> So you you'll you know you'll adjust it by like five percent or something like that, um, but they're not going to do it every year for you. And and typically you are required to look at every value every year. But the complex projects in a small county like us does not get done every year. So you just leave it the same the next year? Well, we'll think? make adjustments. You, you know, adjustments. yeah, it's and like it's like an inflation adjustment type of thing, or you? Well, um, so. When I first came into office, um, there was a Department of Revenue appraisal that was like a year or two old. And I guess they would stop you and say, should we be talking about this? Well, this litigation. This, well, this is a, mm -hmm. an approach to value. Um, I'm not I'm talking. Not sure we weren't getting it. I'm not talking specifics. Okay. Um, because there's other commercial properties that are assessed just like them. Um, they're, a, they're a unique entity as well. So, um, so yeah, so we had an appraisal. We looked at that. We looked at what it was assessed at, and, and we did an adjustment. Um, yeah. And, and that's what, I mean, that's what we do. You, you use the information that you have. Well, it's best effort. Do you have anything else on this? Mm. Dave, do you I, have anything else? I don't know. I'm exhausted now. So <laughs> <laughs> did you get your pool? No, not so far. I, that's, I'm trying to do too many things at once here. Um, okay. I I don't know. I just it's it's always <laughs> frustrating. I don't mean to take this out on you. It's it's not at all because I know this is complicated. But yeah, and it's, it's like, a very complex yeah. issue, you know, and, and we are, our county is unique that we have, you know, we have a lot of uh, unique facilities within our, within our county. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, I mean, I could possibly, God, I hate to volunteer things, but. <laughs> you already did. You, um, well, I, you have no idea what well, was going to go past possibly. I mean, we could look at what it would cost to hire someone for like an income approach. Um, because when when the one wind facility uh, appealed, I think it was, I'm thinking 40 to $60,000. Yeah. No, for a person, for a company to do an appraisal for us to use to defend our value at the BTA. Yeah, that's uh, that sounds accurate to me if that I'm remembering. Somewhere in there, it's been you know that was that. team. So, um, yeah. So I, I I mean that's what it would have cost then. So I would assume it would be in the similar bar park, and that was one facility. That was the cost to assess that one facility. On the income method for that year. No, it would have been a cost approach. 
Now, because on the cost approach. If, on the cost approach, because what happened was is Assessor Johnson <laughs> went from Van's approach to the cost approach. And what happened with that is so you you had this big value that this entity was in the year it was installed. And then she depreciated it to that year, put that value on there for the assessment. And that's what was used. And it was a it was a big difference. And so they appealed their value, but it was the cost approach. It was a it was a big a big addition in cost for them at that moment. Yeah. But then they pay less every year. Their value would reduce each year. Yes. I'm not going to say they pay less because maybe the levy rate's going up, right? Because the levy rate's going up because their value is going down. I'm telling you, it's just, it's, it's like a domino. This is to be quartered. Because you can't. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. When you're like you fighting yourself out of the box. Yeah, yes, I mean, what? yes, they are going to pay less taxes. Yeah, they pay. are, but. Let's be honest. More than likely, not all the time. More than likely. <laughs> well, what happens if another big project comes on or something like that, you know, and increases the the value of the Dave can put in area. a $2 million dollar pool next week. Yeah. Please don't. I want to do comparables <laughs> for $2 billion dollar pools. <laughs> All right, I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna leave it at this now. I think. I think we got plenty of tape uh, for this afternoon to post. <laughs> so. All right. Well, we. Um, anything else anybody wants to bring up before we? No, that that actually went way better than I expected it to. She explained <laughs> it in ways that I could understand it, which was nice. Yeah. Uh, okay. Didn't wholeheartedly answer my question, but I think we. So have what's left out there? Because I don't, I don't like to not have questions answered. Oh, because I'll no, come back. More of a, us whether we want to be um, pressure the state. Um, oh, change. that's up to you guys. That's, that's not up said, to me. That's question. So uh, you know, and these aren't questions for you. Assessors, I went my two yeah, and assessors as a whole, great. they typically try not to create legislature. You know, um, just because we're different. You know, then all, our duties are different. <laughs> our duties are different than your uh -huh. duties, right? So we, you know, we pretty much stick to, you know, cleaning up weird our legislature, you know, um, like for a while we had an RCW that stated, you know, you had to live in your home uh, this many months and we had a whack that said no it had to be this many months to get an exemption and so you know we work on cleaning up those kinds of things um we worked on getting the the senior disabled exemption to being a percent of the county household median income because if you're you know if you're if you're earning forty thousand dollars a year in Klickitat County, you, you know you can live fairly decent in Klickitat County on forty thousand dollars. But if you're in King County you're not going to be able to stay in your home at $40,000. And so it wasn't, and that's the way they were changing. They were changing from, you know, like just in $5,000 increments every so many years. And so there wasn't, you know, similar to, you know, what's going on now with the energy facilities. It's not, it's, it, it's not jiving. So we did, you know, support that. Um, but we really tried to limit our, you know, I'm not going to run out and start pressuring everybody to change the way the way this is done because that's I don't have time. But also, it's just not it's not one of my duties. It's you all's right. and our legislators, our representatives, and you know. But they really need to understand what they're doing because some of the laws that they pass. I don't disagree with you at all. Too bad we can't uh, assess the dams on their income based budget. <laughs> <laughs> I think that do you, do you do like 50% of it then? Yeah, because it's, it's only half, yeah. All right, Mr. Chairman, I'm done. So there's okay. not anything else that's out there that I didn't answer. I don't think so. There okay. probably will be the next three emails I read, but well, I'm available. Thank you. Um, you know, you all can individually come up and or have me back again. Okay. <laughs> All right. We've been trying to sure. back for four and a half months. So. All right.
And I, that's one thing I forgot to do when I first came in. I apologize for not making the last meeting, but honestly, you would not have wanted me here. <laughs> yeah, no, we're good. Because it would not have been just tissues that I needed. Yeah. <laughs> just happy you didn't show up with All right. Girl. Yeah. Well, I don't do that. All right. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Billy. No. Okay. okay. Any other business or are we ready to adjourn? I'm I'm ready to adjourn. Yep. It's long time. Okay. To adjourn. I'll take a motion. Okay, I got a motion a second to adjourn our workshops. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion passed. We're adjourned and I